this uh, aspect in Peru. So the government, the central government and the subnational governments fine tune their internal processes and become able to satisfy the population's needs. In this regard, I salute the presence of authorities and officials from several regions and from the central government. Uh, well, my best wishes for a great exchange on these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we pass the floor to the Minister of uh, Economy, Ms. Claudia Cooper. Uh, thank you very much, Carlos, Ambassador. Mr. Marcus Alexander Antonietti, Swiss Ambassador, Jose Luis Bonifaz, Director of the Public uh, uh, Finance Management of Pacifico University and uh, Director of SECO. It is a pleasure to share with you uh, minutes of our very um, busy agendas because we have a huge commitment in improving public finance. This ministry has been for 10 years now totally committed with uh, management by results. We started 10 years ago with uh, budgeting by results, an approach that marked a milestone in the f uh, public finance management of Peru. We are aware that it's our responsibility at the MEF to improve our administrative systems, the way how we interact with the rest of the state. But it's also true that this can be achieved only with uh, the commitment of subnational authorities. This is uh, teamwork, both institutions, that is the central government and subnational governments need to be potent. Uh, and without this commitment, uh, this will be very difficult. Our objective in uh, our government is to supply quality um, public services. Our aim is citizens. Uh, and sometimes we are um, mixed up with coordination and administration, and we forget about our main aim. But the citizens empowers us to improve their quality of life and get the services they, they need. We have huge challenges in this regard. Uh, despite the progress made, we have huge uh, gaps in key areas. Many people have no water. Many people take hours to go from one place to the other. There are many farmers that are not productive. There are many students who do not have the, uh, the appropriate education. And as we saw yesterday, health services are very insufficient. Uh, the challenge is big, and this cannot be done by a single entity. We have to coordinate. And uh, the MEF is very much uh, um, committed to taking care of our financial situation. If not, this would not be possible. We have to be committed with our national finance. Uh, Financial sustainability, financial health is an absolutely necessary condition so all the other uh, ministries can operate. If we can't have that, we won't have reforms. So uh, implementation of reforms in the different ministries require many elements that go beyond the Ministry of Economy and Finance. Health and education are decentralized, as well as water and sanitation. We have ministry representatives in the regions, and several institutions have deconcentrated agencies. But this deconcentration should be as efficient as possible. It should flow. So we need much more. Uh, again, and uh, here I see several regional leaders we are working with. I think we can make much more, do much more, but the executive branch is working hard on this, and it's a priority for us to establish this um, trust relationship with your leaders, with your institutions, with your officials at the municipalities. 
So joint work at both instances has to be constant because without that, we won't be able to have this system work. And as I said, uh, public finance management starts with uh, fiscal prudence. Um, if, if we overflow, we will uh, have no money for reforms, and reforms are midterm reforms. It, it's a, a reform is not just publishing a bill. Uh, you just start there. So it's a midterm challenge and requires permanent coordination of institutions. That's fundamental. A strong civil service is one of our big challenges. We have to be strong, uh, sound, not heavy. Without good planning, we won't be able to achieve that uh, wish of giving citizens what they merit. We must understand their uh, true needs and um, cater for them. But this has to be done with an important um, control system. Corruption degrades everything. Reforms become paralyzed. Works become paralyzed. We have mountains of uh, works that are uh, stopped. And oftentimes, they are overvalued and distract resources from what uh, where we need them. So without effective uh, control, we won't have uh, an effective uh, supply service for citizens. So we need to uh, coordinate, we need leaderships, and we want to be part of that continuous improvement process. The best reform is the one that never ends. So I thank SECO, the Basel Institute, and Universidad del Pacifico for giving me the chance of being with you at least a few minutes. I'm sure that you will listen to lectures along this morning that will clarify the road we have to take uh, to that uh, um, very important aim, the Peruvian citizen. We will align priorities, which is what uh, we will need. And uh, we are a mid-income country. We have uh, scarce resources, so we need to prioritize and uh, be effective. And of course, we have to have sound public finance. We th then, then we have to generate better services, keep our uh, fiscal soundness, and ensure an, a transparency and integrity um, environment. So I declare this event open, and I wish you the best of successes. Thank you very much. <coughs>
State Secretariat on Economic Issues uh, Affairs um, goes uh, and works with these countries. We have a more traditional one that works with low-income countries and SECO that works with mid-income countries. When we take a look at the areas in which SECO works, um, my division in charge of public finance and uh, uh, international markets and uh, financial intermediaries, then we have our commerce guys and the infrastructure also. We see that uh, we have a complete uh, array uh, to allow uh, countries take advantage of the international economy that has a lot of opportunities but also represents many challenges. In Peru, I'm very happy to have been able to collaborate at least uh, a little bit in strengthening uh, public instances since 2008. Uh, I've been uh, here twice a year for 10 years now, um, taking a look at our programs, how they grow. We have a public finance management uh, program at subnational level, also another program uh, for um, the central government and uh, uh, also uh, public finance at large. And uh, we also complete with other initiatives. Uh, um, we don't call them bilateral because they are implemented by World Bank or uh, the IMF. So they are more international than bilateral. Uh, in this case, uh, we develop a program with a beneficiary uh, country and the international organization implements it. So there are several modalities. We try to find advantages in one or the other. Sometimes we work together. I an example, the in the Ministry of Finance, we work, uh, in the Vice Ministry of Finance, we work uh, uh, on a direct bilateral program with them. Um, but we complete other areas with the World Bank and the IMF where it's more difficult to find the uh, necessary capacities. Public finance, as our ambassador said, uh, is something that uh, we, s we, we are affected by on a daily basis. But managing huge sums of money efficiently uh, is a big challenge. Uh, we see planning, internal control, debt management, uh, public expenditure, all those issues make it very uh, complex very quickly. And when the country is open to international markets, it becomes even more complex because we have to see how uh, markets react. So public finance is also related with what happens in international markets. I wanted to say this because what Peru achieved in the uh, last 15 years has been a very substantial, substantial improvement of its management and that has allowed Peru to benefit more from an open economy. In this regard, this program on public finance management has to reach citizens like a chain. We start by national authorities and we go to the municipal ones. Um, we want to follow up and manage money all along that process and that's a big challenge and we are aware about that too. So we're not here to give you lessons on the country to take a look at how we can face those challenges together. This is a very important day today because we will be debating uh, a number of diagnoses on uh, public finances or public finance. A very complete diagnosis, the PIFA, uh, is something we will uh, deal with later on. We have a new methodology for uh, the PEFA now, uh, which goes, goes in depth in a number of aspects. Uh, we, we can have a very complicated diagnosis for each uh, issue, but with PIFAS, we want to have a general uh, view, uh, a, a comprehensive view of all management to see where we are and where our weaknesses are. Now, 
the purpose of this meeting uh, is that we have to be aware that the PIFA will only identify gaps but will not give solutions. There are other ways of solving these problems. And we are at an interesting point because as from these PIFAs, we'll now start debating on how we can solve the problems. Perhaps more training, per perhaps a newer IT system. There are a number of options. Um, and we have to find uh, the right options. And that requires an exchange among the different governments, uh, central government and local governments that have different realities, different climates, different resources. We should also try to learn some lessons that can be replicated in all of Peru and at all uh, government levels. That's my vision. Uh, I would like to achieve a more efficient system for all the countries. So thank you very much for your presence here. I'm so glad to see you here. You are uh, international specialists, local governors, uh, subnational government uh, officials, uh, the uh, ruling entities. I'm sure that we will have a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. As you know, we will have three uh, di discussion panels this morning. We'll start with the first one. I now invite the four uh, participants, the Vice Minister of um, Finance, Roxana Polastri, uh, the President of uh, CEPLAN's um, Executive Council, Cynthia Su, who is uh, uh, the uh, director of planning at Servir, and Desiria Cosme, who is the planning uh, manager at the uh, Peruvian Comptroller's Office. We're going to start this first panel. The idea is I'm going to moderate it. I'm going to make some questions to our distinguished guests, and they will have seven or eight minutes to answer, and then we will have another round of questions. This panel is very important. You know that in Peru we have 11 administrative systems that are the heart of uh, public management, and in this panel we have the uh, directors of seven of these 11 administrative groups. So I think that this discussion is going to be extremely important in that sense. I would like to ask to our Vice Minister of uh, Finance that is responsible of four of these systems, what is the strategy that the Ministry of Economics and Finances has regarding a public finance management. We know that for some years we have had a strategy and currently we are revising it to update it. So I would like to ask Rosanna, what are these uh, particular items or important items in the new uh, strategy for public finance management? Good morning. Thank you, Carlos, for the invitation. Uh, just a small introduction. It is a pleasure to be here with you, uh, sharing with my predecessor this panel. Uh, he started many of the reforms that we are deepening today and that we are also more modernizing. This is also my house. I studied here in Pacifico University, and I'm very proud to be here. Regarding the question that Carlos is asking me, 
about what are the new uh, guidelines that we are developing for uh, public finance management. First of all, I would like to frame them in our goals, in our public finance management goals that are general objectives. The first one is to ensure sustainability, fiscal sustainability, having public finances that are sustainable and healthy. This is the first objective or goal. The second thing is to have a uh, strategic allocation of resources. And the third is an appropriate supply of goods and services. I think that these are the three main objectives. They are very clear. We must have them uh, very clear uh, for public finances, especially for revenue. How do we achieve this? Uh, each country is going to have a different approach is going to use different management models depending on the country's particularities, on the uh, systems that they have, on the uh, level of decentralization, etc. So we uh, start with these three objectives. These three objectives are extremely important for us. So the improvement of fi public finance, finance management is a continuous for us. In our uh, Revenue Vice Ministry, this is our way of thinking. We're always looking on ways to improve how we improve uh, public finance management, because this is our responsibility. So uh, one, of our, uh, one of the pillars of our second phase uh, for the program of public finance management is multi-annuality. The uh, law for uh, the Fiscal Transparency and Responsibility Act look at public finances in a multi-annual way. We have a deficit trajectory that uh, has set as an ad objective for three years. Uh, budget and expenditure have always been looked at in an annual way. And it is true that the Constitution says that the budget is approved annually. However, this, uh, this however, we have a multi-annual uh, vision of how we assign expenditure. This is a very uh, strong change and very important change because it is related to fiscal sustainability. Because expenditure doesn't finish in December, it's not uh, there where it ends. We have to have a multi-annual vision on how we program budget. More than three years from the uh, expenditure point of view, expenditure allocation point of view, it's a little bit difficult, but we have to have that vision. Examples such as uh, building hospitals, we know that once the uh, hospital is finished building, we are going to have operation maintenance. So this has to be incorporated in the programming of budget. So this this vision, this multi-annual vision has already been installed. We have a uh, multi-annual budget because uh, because the, the, the annual law is not binding. We uh, call it a multi-annual budget, and this uh, is useful uh, for us because we revise it tri triannually. This is um, well aligned with our forecasts and our goals for uh, a deficit. The second great pillar of our management is related to uh, integrated management of uh, actives and passives. We have had great progress here. We have uh, liability. In terms of liabilities, our objective is not only uh, a residual. Like, for example, we need this finance man. We don't have our resources, and we have to admit a debt or uh, hire a loan or ask for a loan. What we want is that our liabilities are managed efficiently. What does this mean? It means we have to uh, try to substitute debt that was contracted years ago with very high rates when we didn't have an investment grade. So now we have started with a active with an active policy for uh, debt administration policies, 
what does this mean? I issue a bonds that replace a debt that was more expensive, and this um, helps me to uh, lower costs. Uh, to this also helps me to um, deepen the market, so uh, it's it's better for us. So we have doing these debt operations uh, for several years, and this has uh, created savings. For example, last year we used these funds for uh, the reconstruction. We have also implemented a platform. We are members of the Euroclear platform. This has also been uh, a very important milestone because now uh, investors that cannot buy uh, <coughs> debt in Solis can now do it uh, through the platform, uh, the, the Euroclear platform. This uh, helps us to minimize uh, the exposure to uh, change risks. Uh, so that we can solarize our debt, and this is uh, pretty healthy. And also regarding uh, assets and liabilities management, uh, a success that we have had last week was the contract of a bond or a catastrophic uh, insurance that we have with the Pacific Alliance. It is important to underline that this is the first action that we are uh, having with the Pacific Alliance. And we have uh, emitted a bond with the World Bank that is a AAA entity. And by joining, uh, the joining of the three countries, the, the benchmark has been great. Uh, so the conditions that we have obtained are very good. The uh, demands for the Peruvian book were very high. It was three times what we needed, which has given us an indication that there is a trust in uh, our Peruvian economy, the solidity of our Peruvian economy. This is our first, first uh, catastrophic bond or insurance. For us, the uh, events that came from the Niño Costero and our need to um, finance the, re the reconstruction and rehabilitation has made us think that we have to move towards more modern instruments in which not everybody is uh, expenditures. We have also to use uh, catastrophic insurances and uh, tools like that. Then we have the pillar of uh, transparency. Here we are deepening the use of um, budget instruments. We have to move. Uh, we, we have to make these indicators binding and also the uh, budgetary allocations because as we heard this morning earlier, getting to the citizen, uh, taking the taking uh, goods and services to the citizen that are quality and that are uh, correctly um, focused is our responsibility. And I also think that uh, a very important topic today is transparency and integrity. I think that here we have to work more deeply uh, regarding integrity, regarding transparency. From our side and finance and revenue, transparency is achieved with better uh, systems, more precise systems, more updated systems that can generate information. The power of information and of data is very important and civil society demands it. And we could uh, work uh, jointly with them to elevate the attention uh, towards these topics. I, maybe I have exceeded my time. I'm sorry, Carlos. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Minister. It's very interesting to know the key points of the strategy that will be applied during the next years. One of the uh, relevant topics so that all of these strategies are successful starts with planning. In that sense, I wanted to ask Javier Abogatas what is being done from CEPLAN to strengthen the uh, planning for the short term or the uh, planning system for the short term and also to link it with the budgetary system. Javier, you have the floor. Good morning to you all. Uh, to talk about the national planning system, we need to say that is uh, weak. Uh, planning is not present. 
planning is not present in the mindset of most of the population public officials so that is a first that's a problem uh, we started in 2016 to uh, talk about long-term uh, scenarios that were very compatible with OSC and we asked the ministries to update uh, their uh, national sectorial policies uh, so we needed the public policy to fix objectives uh, Peru is a unitary country so these sectorial objectives have to serve as a reference for the three levels of government so that was done in September, October 2016. You may see the documents in the CEPLAN web page. Uh, these were distributed in the executive GORES, uh, the meetings that assemble the regional govern govern governors and the ministers. We talked about how to link uh, the three levels of governments because fractioning uh, is another proven characteristic that is difficult to overcome. So during the first GORES, we talked about uh, these topics uh, during the second gore these elements were presented for updated uh, national policy so that a governor could refer easily uh, to some orientation for policies and indicators for 2021 that was a first step this step is going to be renewed now in march to allow to have plans for 2019 and 2020-2021. Before institutions had an opening in December, they put it another way and they said it was a plan. And this didn't have strategic uh, planning or cost centers. But now for the 19 ministries we have and the 26 government, uh, regional governments and the 11 autonomous government uh, organisms, we have a strategic approach with costs. Uh, that look at also some additional elements for the long term. What is going to be the step uh, this year, the next step this year? Because we were starting from a very weak point last year. So this year we're starting to work and the objective are the 196 provinces in the country so that they can enter this process to improve policies and plans guided by state policies, national policies, uh, s sector policies. <laughs> And what is elaborated in the territory is uh, how are these uh, concerted plans, development plans approved? Because uh, Peru is a very heterogeneous country. Can you imagine the coast, the ocean, the Amazon, the Andes? Everybody is trying to adapt. So the goal are the 196 provinces. but. We can now look at a province uh, through our information systems by taking the uh, MEF system, uh, what they have at the uh, budget uh, directorate. So now we have this system that allows us to enter a province and see what the three levels of government are doing. Not one, but the three of them. We think that this is a provincial responsibility that hasn't been taken on to look at the province's infrastructure. This is where we should go for diagnosis and for future planning, looking at the lives of the people in the territory. Now in Peru, we could say that we have 2,800 public entities, so we cannot work with all of them. So what we had done uh, last year is that the ministries, the autonomous authorities, the controller's office, the judicial power, the judiciary and the legislative power have been uh, working together. So how do we respect the institutions uh, but also work on the reg regional level? Because it has to work as a link between the, the provincial and national level. So we have talked to the governors. We have several governors here, like, for example, the governor of Apurimac. Apurimac is maybe uh, the one that has the most advance in this. And we should uh, start saying we have the provincial level uh, but along with the national uh, part uh, along with CONCITEC along with the universities we could improve uh, the analysis of the uh, territorial complexity so that we can give support to a provincial municipality because we cannot give uh, support to 2,800 entities so we have to have uh, mandates I would uh, ask 
like to ask Edgar Cruzado why we have law since 2002 that says that let's say that a province are not like a district because we have a mandate to in integrate districts and we haven't done that we have sent a letter to each uh, provincial mayor that w and we have copied the governors and we have asked them to do this very difficult job even in an electoral year we hope that in November we will have clear results uh, to give out information to the regional governments and uh, mayors that will be elected in November. We think that this transit is very important and we also have given you uh, a sheet of paper that is in, on your table. Peru, as the other countries, has signed the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And you can uh, find on CEPLAN's webpage uh, how we presented this to the uh, high-level uh, forum of the United Nations. And we also have the uh, National Agreement Forum, and we, c we will maybe comment on this later. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. All of these topics that you are mentioning have always been pending, and I'm happy to know that right now they are being uh, tackled directly. It is also true that all these plans that we have for the future uh, need people to implement them. This is what we need in the end. In that sense, the administrative system uh, for human resources is extremely important. So I wanted to ask Cynthia, in this case, to tell us what is the linkage between the human resources system and uh, public management uh, and public finance management and what is Servir doing in this sense? Thank you, Carlo. Good morning to everyone. Actually, there is a lot of relationships between hu human resources and the rest because human resources is the center. Uh, it is the uh, motor for change in the modernization of the state. We have in modernization five pillars, four of them have to do with procedures, better plans, uh, better follow-up, uh, how we can uh, budget better, but uh, one of the pillars is how we could have a better civil service, how we can improve ourselves as people. So here we have to take something into uh, account. The servers are those who implement policies, procedures, those who manage resources, uh, especially financial resources, among others. So our motor uh, are the servers, are the public servants. So if we don't uh, change, uh, nothing will change just through procedures and policies. So our relationship with the rest of administrative systems is that any reform implies a cultural change, uh, change in our chip, uh, so that we can uh, carry out everything that we want to do. So here we have uh, a challenge, how to strengthen uh, capacity improvement in people. How can we also improve training and qualifications of the people that work for the state? And in subnational management, what we see is a dilemma. We have all the public budget, and we have to divide it in personal exp expenditure, personnel expenditure, and particularly in local governments. Uh, there is current expenditure, uh, fixed expenditure, and between personal expenditure and fixed expenditure, we have 90% of uh, expenditure, so we have very little for investment expenditure. So how can we improve the execution of works, services, and budget if we have 90% in current expenditure? And here we also have to see that in personnel, we have uh, people with an administrative career and in the caste regime that is temporary, and we cannot increase the people that are fixed uh, because that's, that could be a, a bomb in terms of management. So that is a dilemma that we have in terms of expenditure. So this uh, low capacity, this low execution capacity, can be seen in two ways. First of all, there are not necessarily capacities, but there also may be uh, corruption. 
that we were talking about a minute ago. So in Servir, our proposal is to have a professionalized civil service with values and with social conscience. And we have done several things in this uh, sense since 2008, which was a rear year of creation. So how do we work on the integrity aspect? The integrity uh, by following OCD uh, recommendations, how we can have transversal cross-sector values that, should, that every public official should have from the positive point of view and not necessarily from the uh, anti-corruption standpoint. And since 2013, in the National uh, School for Public Administration, we started uh, having the ethics course. Now, uh, more than 9,000 people have participated in this course, and it tries to identify and analyze the ethical dilemma that we have in management. A second point that we're working on uh, since 2016 is a, a study of local governments. We have gathered information, uh, detailed information, of the local government's particularities. We have been in 73 municipalities in 15 regions. We have interviewed more than 9,000 people. We have uh, collected information about uh, jobs, processes uh, from these 9,000 people to adapt people to adapt our tools to the local government's specificities or particularities because the uh, people working in the municipality uh, is very different from the rest of the country. Sometimes they have less than 20 people, so management is very complicated. And we have also some, we have also done some uh, publishings to uh, open the debate. Uh, regarding uh, the jobs and also indigenous languages to improve services for the citizens. And the third point are the uh, knowledge diagnosis. Uh, we have to identify uh, knowledge gaps in daily work. We have done a diagnosis for seven administrative systems. Uh, we have had 18,000 people participating in these diagnoses. And for example, in public investment, 82% of operators are in national governments. Uh, in human resources and accountability, we have uh, the national government. And this allows us and the governing bodies to see the knowledge gaps in each competency area. So if we had to summarize the uh, Servir's job, it is to generate institutionalism, uh, and wholesome uh, growth of people by promoting uh, values in front of the citizenship. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Now I would like to ask Desire, that is representing uh, the General Controller's Office. Well, I would like to ask her, what is the General Controller's Office Office's uh, role in regarding the management of uh, public finance finances. We know that unfortunately there is a lot of uh, legal uh, aspects and so the controller's office is a body that helps to sanction legal actions but that also promotes a better public uh, management. In that sense, Desiree, what is the diagnosis that you have um, regarding all of this? Thank you, Carlos. Good morning. To you all, uh, I would like to uh, divide my answer in three notions that we are evaluating at the controller's office. First of, all, first of all, governmental control, then the role of the controller's office, and finally, understanding that uh, we cannot act alone as a controller's office because the governmental control uh, tries to guarantee um, efficient public expenditure, but we don't work alone. Corruption uh, leads to a suspension of projects uh, that are related to corrupt uh, companies. This affects cost opportunity cost. More than 11 uh, million solids are lost through corruption, and this affects um, public expenditure. And this has to do, of course, with social, the social aspects, social inclusion. It also stops national and international uh, investment. It uh, also affects 
the business climate uh, due to the lack of uh, transparency and security. Uh, big investments cannot be financed. This is also perturbed too. At a mi micro level, corruption avoids uh, companies from growing. It increases costs and it creates uh, legal problems too. Uh, this also makes uh, keeps co um, highways from being finished. It uh, generates over costs and uh, for example, uh, used waters uh, are uh, put into the rivers and they uh, increase um, illnesses. These high costs are linked to corruption without considering the cost that demands its uh, judging and sanction by the public ministry and by the judiciary. By the prosecutor and by the judiciary. So what, was, what does the Comptroller's Office uh, do? The Comptroller's Office fights against uh, functional uh, misbehavior and uh, improves the quality of uh, public uh, actions. It's not sufficient to uh, detect and sanction misbehavior. We have to study and analyze through performance audits what are the limitations um, that uh, public uh, official uh, cannot execute in that regard. It's not enough for citizens uh, to have a controller, the controller's office um, to show there is embezzlement or that there is favoring to a contractor. She made a mistake and said a congressman or a congress member and then she corrected herself and said a contractor. <laughs> Well, with due respect to Congress members, please excuse me. Well, um, there is a third dimension, and it's referred to uh, articulating or coordinating the uh, control system with citizens and the main players uh, in the prosecutor's uh, office and the judiciary. As I said at the beginning, we cannot do that alone. We have to work, as a Minister of uh, Economy said, we need to work in teams. We have to acknowledge the fundamental role that uh, civil um, society uh, has in fighting corruption uh, in all the strategies aimed at um, improving um, our actions against corruption. Uh, corruption is very creative and complex, and that's their modus operandi in different public processes. In that regard, I'd like to thank the, the officials, the mayors, uh, to work in a team with us. Uh, as you know, the Comptroller's Office is being restructured. We're making lots of changes. We want to work preventively. We wa want to work hand in hand with the um, judiciary and with um, the prosecutor's office. Thank you very much. Thank you, Desiree. We'll uh, start a second round. I think there are many topics that are to be discussed Rosana, what comes in the future in terms of uh, reforms of uh, public finance management? And what's the role for subnational governments? We have several uh, governors, mayors, and different um, officials from uh, regional and local governments. So what is their role in the future? Thank you. I think an important thing we should do in the future, taking into account uh, what uh, the other panelists have said, is joint work. It's uh, the aspect of human resources is extremely important, and also the controller's office role. 
um, we have a great opportunity now because the Comptroller's Office is uh, becoming modernized and reformed so that they don't act after uh, things happen five or seven years after a project ended, we find problems, and that's um, a loss that is sometimes unrecoverable. So the work they are doing now, for example, with the Authority of Reconstruction, uh, they do joint work, concurring work, and that helps uh, to have a tender uh, processes, design processes, also those that define um, the project scope to be started um, are better. And the idea is not just the Comptroller's office is asking me to change a comma or a dot in my document. Uh, on, on, on the side of servir, the most uh, important and uh, the most of our services uh, have to do with human resources and the uh, most important he are health and education. These are uh, ministries that are intensive in the use of human resource resources. So um, the role of Servir in managing uh, all these people in uh, helping those um, officials um, be able to develop their work with a vision and commitment to serve citizens is something we need to strengthen. And this is a challenge because we have seen a lot of corruption, which can mean lowering our morale. We all feel uh, hit by what is happening, and we don't want to be uh, included with those others who are uh, corrupt because we are doing many good things. Uh, uh, so what is happening right now concerning corruption should not stop, stop us in our joint uh, work. Um, so that's the challenge ahead, working together. Um, these three entities are becoming modernized, and that is also uh, opening spaces for collaboration. At CEPLAN, we have, you know, a multi-annual perspective, and we work uh, quite well on that. In the future, um, PFM with uh, local governments has a challenge, and it is to develop a reform that will allow them to generate income. That is a pending agenda that uh, we have to work on in the executive branch together with uh, subnational governments. Without that, we won't be able to have efficient uh, PFM uh, or complete PFM. We can take some steps and reach some gains concerning uh, property taxes. We can widen the base of uh, property taxes and show that we can have a true decentralization. Uh, I think you will be talking about decentralization later. Um, however, uh, if we don't generate uh, income uh, in regional and local governments, we won't be able to uh, reach a good level of goods and services for our citizens and close the gaps we need to close. And finally, we should go in depth uh, in using modern instruments in our management. We want to go to a single payroll system. I don't know if it will be an additional system or if it will be part of our budget. We're debating on that. Uh, that's a pending agenda again. As it was uh, well said, the percentage of uh, mm, payroll in the budget is quite high. 65% of uh, current expenditures uh, uh, and it's very rigid in terms of expenditure. When you have a shock, uh, where do, do you get that shock in public investment? Because we have a huge payroll. 
we have um, uh, even um, we we have people in the payroll and also we have uh, the, the the people who are outsourced but we need to pay all those so we get hit in our public investment because of this so we need to um, have mechanisms to have some better adjustment to shocks that's also a pending agenda thank you very much uh, madam minister madam vice minister um, a while ago, Javier Aguatas was uh, talking about the document you received that talks about uh, the, uh, not the short term, but uh, this thing of the pre-image. What, what does pre-image mean? Uh, I, I guess that after the pre-image, you get an image. And what, the, what do you mean by Peru to 2030, which is something you're working on? Well. Uh, pre-image. Pre-image is building a uh, concerted vision of our country. That's what our constitution mandates. That's what our laws state. And um, we started in that process last year, we went to the um, Acuerdo Nacional Forum, and we uh, submitted this uh, pre-image because we want to generate uh, this uh, uh, concerted vision with several political parties, uh, the civil society, etc. This is not very common in other countries. We're building it uh, together with the um, um, consensus building roundtable, and we want to have this vision approved in 2019 at the Forum of the Acuerdo Nacional. So to 2020, we want to have our s government policies revised because they come from uh, 2002. So we're updating and building the plan that will go, according to this forum, to 2030. There are some people who say we should go to 2050 or 2070. Uh, that's open in our system. We're taking 2030 because that's the United Nations uh, agreement. and. Uh, the 2030 uh, agenda uh, regarding sustainable uh, development objectives. Uh, that's why we're doing that. In 2016, INAE published the 240 uh, indicators, and Peru has 110 sound uh, indicators. Uh, but our um, program has 500 more indicators that help us uh, measure what we are doing. And um, who uh, are we thinking about when we design public policies or plans? We're thinking about the people, local governments. And, and the agreement is what you have on this paper. Sim uh, to, to, to speak simply, at the beginning, we propose an image to start debating. And uh, in a nutshell, it says nobody should lose his or her potential for causes we can avoid, violence, accidents, pollution, things that can be avoided. Uh, one million children with anemia in Peru are losing potential um, connections in their brains, so they won't reach their potential. Also, we have to learn to manage uh, issues, including climate change, uh, through prevention. And we don't have the habit for prevention. And we are not also used to, uh, uh, or either used to uh, risk management. So we need uh, a lot of knowledge uh, for this. And that's the role of the academia and the research center to get to know our territory in a better way. Our, our territory is very complex. Also, improving production and productivity, and that goes hand in hand with uh, employment quality. And the last one has to do with governance and a peaceful country, another of our problem. And uh, this same thing goes f at international level that joins us with the 2030 agenda. If you see, this is what uh, our um, steering uh, um, committee approved that we have part of the people from the executive branch, but also people from universities, um, 
uh, professional associations and regional governments. We approved this before going to the Acuerdo Nacional, and it says, let's better know our reality. First, we have to look uh, locally at uh, watersheds, ecosystems, development axes, the population, etc. Uh, the gaps of infrastructure and access to public services, times and distances to public services. These are things we are also debating with the OECD in the territorial aspects of a country. And uh, poli state policies are related to all this. There are 25 functions of the uh, state or of government that we need to uh, get to know the local reality concerning each specific point. Uh, we're also working with the Decentralization Secretariat, um, and uh, we are making it concrete in terms of watersheds, because watersheds cross several regions and departments. Uh, so. Um, we have to act in both cases. We also have provinces, and provinces are 196. They have a mandate that has not been complied with. They are the integrators of uh, planning, planning and following up infrastructure. That's their objective this year. That's the knowledge that has to go specifically to um, people's uh, well-being. And that's the image. That's the image we have to see in each province. We have gaps like cultural diversity or different difficulties. Uh, we have elections this year. And I hope we will be able to have a better transfer. We're working with the Comptroller's Office and the uh, Elections uh, Council to provide the people all the information about this pre-image and. Uh, including the report we submitted before 140 countries last year. We will have an annual report that will encompass the progress made in policies and plans. And Peru has no um, um, habit of this. After hyperinflation and terrorism, we have always been people who look at things in the short term. We need to learn how to look at the long term. Fortunately, we have several people uh, from the provinces here, from the regions here, who want to, uh, who want to um, act in the long term, but they also need to take into account um, their difficult short term. Um, <coughs> Uh, we also have 11 administrative systems to deal with uh, at uh, the MEF. We have to um, simplify things with these 11 systems. Um, there are some hurdles, such as logistics, for example, that has no uh, return. Uh, the, the entire execution uh, is um, locked up when we have problems with our contractors uh, or whatever, and then we're um, in a stagmire. Um, and uh, another thing is transparency to dissuade corruption. Those are immediate steps on our daily operation, but also taking into account the long term. We need to have this discussion uh, society, state, political parties. Every time w we have talked about this in the OECD, they don't understand us much. Uh, the idea is to have a better well-being of our population in all our complex territory. Thank you very much, Javier. I wanted to announce you that we are um, transmitting this panel and the entire event by Facebook and YouTube, and we have lots of questions from the audience who are not here, but they are in their uh, works, in their jobs, or in their homes. One question is about the Servir Law. Um, Cynthia, what is the condition or what is the status of the civil service law? 
I understand the CP of the ONP has uh, been recently approved. Uh, can you please comment what's coming in the future and what's the role of subnational governments in the implementation of this very important reform for the country? As Javier said a while ago, how do we generate uh, state vision to 2030? And how can we make to have the civil service become a guarantee of this state vision? Uh, uh, a big challenge is to have a cultural change that is civil service based upon merit. Uh, we have made progress in the country along these 25 years in this regard, but we still need to work on that. This reform has three, three aspects. One is institutional improvement. What, what does this mean? How can entities reach a certain degree of efficiency to uh, provide better services to citizens through a better civil service. The second aspect of this reform is how do we improve our civil servants promoting their development. And then there is a transit, uh, and it is not only a change of regime, we also need the organization to look at itself internally uh, and identify improvements to make their processes more efficient and then determine what is the optimum headcount for the institution. Uh, in the last years, there um, we have had unplanned growth. Um, even though we have had uh, some restrictions in um, personal growth. However, we see the payroll growing in terms of uh, 40,000 people every month. And uh, we need to, to improve that to give better service to, uh, service to our citizens. The first entity that finished this internal analysis is the, the ONP, that is the pension office. The ONP has um, its organizational structure uh, ready. That was the milestone in this first analysis. So they are ready uh, for any uh, public contracting uh, through this new regime that is uh, more beneficial. Uh, the ONP has done this in-house work. They have reflected upon themselves with their own internal teams. One of the challenges for the rest of the entities is how t they strengthen their uh, organization for this internal analysis without consultants for in-house work. The idea is uh, for them to do this and strengthen their capacities. There are 377 entities in this transit process along several stages. We have 11 regional governments, 150 municipalities, and besides the ONP, there are 38 entities that have progressed a lot, so they are following in the steps of the ONP. One has a CPE 38 um, uh, on progress and 376 entities uh, in the process. And at the end of this year, all the entities should be included in this institutional improvement. So following some OECD recommendations, we want to decentralize reform. We want to operate more transparently and sensitize the public opinion because we need citizen backup. Among our challenges and short-term actions in Servir, we have finishing the adaptation of tools for local governments. We have to adapt tools to their reality so they don't work for the ruling entity, but devote their efforts to improve their services to citizens. Also, how to determine um, 
salaries for local governments. We are working with a Ministry of Economy. Uh, we have uh, progressed in terms of national and regional governments, but we don't have local governments yet. Also, strengthening uh, capacities for uh, entities to be able to make this internal in-house analysis uh, with uh, technical aid from Servir all along the process. In a nutshell, how can we give this reform sustainability? This reform started several years ago, and we have to uh, realize that there's no step behind. We can make adjustments, but there's no, there's no return. And we have some results in this effort, a joint effort we uh, make as um, the entire state. Brazil, for example, took 24 years. Chile took 12 years. Uh, and just for uh, part of the state, we are very ambitious. We're talking about more than half a million people at three government levels in six years, a big challenge. And we want to achieve this uh, vision of state we have. Thank you very much. Very good news. There are many, many questions through uh, uh, the um, the internet. Some are related to the controller's office or public officials who are connected, and they are saying that a sad reality is that there are many uh, public or civil servants uh, that um, um, are undergoing what they consider unfair processes. Now. What comes in the future at the Comptroller's Office then? Uh, what is this new uh, control, control approach? Uh, how have you always uh, worked? Uh, and how are you going to work now? Thank you very much, Carlos. I have written a number of notes, and I'd like to share them with you. Uh, in terms of control reform, there are two important points. That is, reinforcement and consolidation of the deconcentrated management model. Uh, it should reorient the resources and capacities to uh, regional uh, con control offices, uh, strengthening their competences in terms of um, governmental control and supervision. Uh, by implementing this model, we expect that uh, the regional controllers' offices have a more determining participation in achieving their objectives and um, targets. The new change is that uh, we act uh, preventively, uh, that is, uh, previously, then also simultaneously, as uh, the vice minister said, concurring control. And we are working there in uh, the reconstruction with changes. This new approach means that we have to be proactive. Our auditors have to be proactive, anticipating deficiencies in the public sector, taking a look at irregularities, identifying possibilities for improvement in public services to citizens. Through this simultaneous control, we will issue alerts, avoiding any irregularities. The idea is not to wait until things change and have exposed control. We have to work preventively, hand in hand with all the authorities. In this regard, we focus the big concerns of a country, and we are considering for the uh, national control system, and not only for the controller's office, three important points. Uh, concerning the plan uh, for reconstruction with uh, changes. Uh, our controller is in Puta. He's working precisely on this. He's uh, traveling on a weekly basis to each region to see what are the needs, um, what the uh, government control strategy will be, uh, what uh, will the integrated uh, approach be. Uh, we say this is 
a model to accompany institutions per control milestones. We will work with citizens as monitors who will uh, help us see any anomalies. Also, mega projects that are um, that are considered into an integral plan per project and also subnational control to guarantee efficient uh, control coverage. We are considering uh, the decentralized efficient control system. What is this system? The, the idea is to take advantage of scale economies to install uh, itinerating control um, systems, those districts that have never been supervised, we will reach them. Um, we have a target this year. Each district will be visited, uh, however remote it is, will be visited twice this year. So these are the important points we wanted to share with you. Thank you, Desiree. We have a couple of minutes, so I wanted to ask the Vice Minister to answer a question that is coming from social media and that is related to the constant modifications that are done to the budget during its execution. The famous PIM, the modified institutional budget that is very different from the aperture budget that is approved by Congress. You have already mentioned uh, programming and multi-annuality, but I wanted to ask also if uh, you could talk to us about this uh, how can we reduce the gap uh, between what is approved by Congress and what is actually executed? Yes, that is, I don't know if it's a problem, but it's a particularity of a public budget that has produced a little bit of disorder and a lack of uh, previsibility. The important steps that we have taken so that uh, the budget is not constantly modified is uh, to advance many of the transfers that are done to the uh, regional and local governments. In the past, what happened is that transfers happened from January to August and the and with this uh, the modifications happened constantly and this produced that next year, if you have transferred in August, what you have transferred in August was very difficult to execute and it was too late. So you had to have new modifications for the next year. So it, this was transferred from year to year. So what, what we have done for on our side, our engagement, is to work with the ministries that do these transfers so that these transfers are done very early in the year uh, they are mostly related to investment projects. Why aren't these put in the budget? Because the investment project is not finished. It's technical file, it's not finished. Some are not, some are not defined, they are still in the phase of ideas, so they cannot be put in the budget when we send it in August. So these are two channels that we are pushing to uh, decrease this, which is to uh, advance transfers. And on the other hand, with the reform that we have had in Invierte P, we have tried to train, we have looked to train the uh, executing bodies that design their projects so that they are ready before and so that we can have a good base of projects that don't need to wait between January and uh, March to be incorporated. Well, thank you very much to our participants. I think that it is very clear for us there that uh, there is a lot of work that is being done. Maybe we don't know much about this work, uh, but it is really recognized um, and appreciated in the public sector. If I can mention something uh, to finish, it's the great effort of articulation that is being done among administrative systems. It is extremely difficult uh, due to human nature. When I had to uh, serve in the public sector in the Ministry of Economy, it was difficult to coordinate even inside the ministry. So you can imagine what it is to coordinate between other administrative bodies. 
but I can see that there is that determination, that leadership. So I wanted to recognize the great effort that is being done uh, to create this articulation that is necessary for the country. Please, let's applaud our participants. Thank you very much. Um, I invite now Julia Cori from the Basel Institute that is going to moderate the second panel so that she can present her panelists. Good morning. I'm going to call now Martin Forst. Edgardo Cruzado, Pedro Luis Rodriguez, and Carlos Casas. Carlos Casas. Good morning to everyone. After having heard the interesting thoughts on the importance of public finance management for uh, services. In this panel, we are going to discuss the country vision and international standards in public finance management. For this, we have three very important representatives, two from the international area and one from the national area. Uh, particularly from the executive power. We have Martin Forst, who is a chief of the government division for the OCDE. We have Pedro Rodriguez, which is a senior economist from the uh, World Bank's office in Peru. And finally, we have Edgardo Cruzado, which is uh, a secretary for decentralization in the uh, Mi Council of Ministers Presidency. We're going to start our, our dialogue with Martin. We have talked a lot during the first panel about governance, implementation of uh, OCD recommendations. We know that during the uh, last years, on the request of the Peruvian state, OCD has developed several studies, uh, mainly regarding public governance. So. We would like uh, to hear Martin on the linkage that exists between the uh, governance, uh, international governance standards and the improvement of uh, public finance management. Thank you, Julia. Good morning to everyone. I'm going to speak in Spanish. My Spanish is a little bit limited, but I'm going to uh, take this challenge and this risk. I'm going to uh, talk about international standards. It may sound a little bit abstract or theoretical, but it's not actually. Uh, se our work in SECO has showed us that international standards can be very significant and very useful in a country. I want to tell you that, as you know, Peru has worked for some years with OCD, and OCD has worked with Peru. We have a country program, and uh, 
now there is a possibility to have uh, and now Peru may integrate OCDE in these in this framework of course this would be more than very important uh, for Peru to adopt many international uh, standards and OCDE standards so that it can access the organization but it this will also lead to the improvement of public services in Peru. I wanted to speak a bit about these OCD standards in the uh, governmental sector. These standards are used for country studies to do recommendations, but we do not uh, manufacture these standards in our offices in an isolated manner. It is a, a process that is truly collective. These standards are uh, the basis for uh, good practices in uh, member and non-member uh, countries. For example, we have the recommendations for open government from 2017. These recommendations also include uh, open, uh, open budget, and they are based on 15 years of uh, work and uh, good and bad uh, experience and data collection. We have uh, written this with a group of experts from many countries, uh, including Peru, we first uh, um, wrote a project and then we did consultations with NGOs, for example. This is to say that these recommendations and international standards are not so theoretical or ideological, they are mostly practice. Practice that comes from the countries. We have done a uh, public government's review for Peru two or three years ago. And briefly, or in a nutshell, I would have three messages that are linked to uh, public finance management. First of all, the uh, public finance management is not an element, an isolated element. I will talk about this later. Number two, uh, subnational level is key. Uh, here, the, uh, there are many uh, people responsible for regions, and we have all to work and row together. So the first uh, item, uh, public finance management is not an isolated uh, element. Sometimes when I speak with colleagues in our office in Paris, or with um, public officers in different countries, it seems that there is an invisible division between people that work in public finances and the other people that work on uh, administration, public governance, etc. There is a, a small division. I don't know if it's culture or if it's uh, technical language. The techni really, it's a technical language. But it's very important because an element cannot uh, survive with the other elements. So that is one of our um, recommendations uh, regarding budgetary governance. Uh, good budgeting comes is supported by the different uh, public governance pillars, which are uh, transparency, integrity, uh, openness, participation, responsibility, and a strategic approach for planning, like uh, we do with CEPLAN, uh, present here. But in the uh, public governance revision, we can also see that a more critical sentence that uh, besides the solid uh, bu uh, result by budgets, the uh, u limited use of evidence in the implementation of public policies, uh, s public service design and linkages and limited linkages with strategic planning at a national level, uh, hamper the capacity of the government to achieve results, uh, improve them, and give and have follow-up of the improvements for the citizens. So, 
the true challenge for uh, reforms in public management is to ensure that uh, the uh, financial management is integrated in public management. So the project of Basel Institute with SECO has uh, is this integrated di dimension. So that was my most important uh, point because the other points which are the importance of the local part is something I don't need to explain here. Everybody knows it and the players are present. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Martin, for your interesting intervention. As we know, um, tax centralization has an impact on public uh, finances. I would like to ask Pedro, what are the main conclusions uh, that the World Bank has arrived to in its recent publication on the uh, fiscal decentralization in national governments in Peru? Thank you, Julia, and thank everyone for inviting the World Bank. I think that we are in the uh, path of uh, an even more interesting uh, discussion about what SECO has done with the uh, Universidad del Pacifico with subnational governments regarding uh, fiscal decentralization. We have a study at a Latin American level in which we compare Peru with uh, other countries in the region. Uh, there are three factors that you know already, but that I'm going to summarize. First of all, decentralization of political levels is pretty pecu peculiar. If we want to talk about an example, the city of Arequipa or Lima are not equivalent to Quito, Bogota, or uh, Paris. They are uh, more decentralized entities that what we consider. So the discussion on provincial municipalities can be very relevant for Peru, but not necessarily for other countries in Latin America. That is point number one. And in relation to that, there is the openness that has that Peru has to open municipalities in terms in legal terms. That continuous fragmentation of responsibilities and functions is something that is a little bit unusual, and that is latent in Peru, s specific to the country. Uh, regarding uh, fiscal architecture, there is a diamond that we always look at in terms of, of harmony and decentralization of a country. And here, the most important thing to notice is that in contrast with other countries in the region and the world, Peru has decentralized very much the public expenditure and very little the uh, resource allocation. I think that in that sense, uh, what was discussed before is very relevant. Uh, how, how to help regional governments that don't have a canon to use um, other tax uh, instruments. And uh, other things have very, uh, other functions have been very decentralized too. And that doesn't uh, take uh, scale economies to provide efficient uh, services such as uh, health, education, and other functions that are usually uh, a little bit more s centralized than what we see in Peru. The third point is the uh, transfer system that exists in Peru and that is one of the best in terms of design transfers uh, towards municipalities, the Foncomu, uh, that has an international formula that is uh, pretty good. And the Foncortu, but with certain limitations that are maybe dominating. Foncor doesn't have money, so uh, the formula is very good, but not a lot of money is transferred uh, to the governments. So there is a different system for uh, uh, the transfer during the year uh, of, of this money. And the Foncomu, that is something that we have discussed very much with our colleagues uh, from the Ministry of Economy and Finance. 
it does not include uh, elements of um, collection capacity. In other words, the municipalities that have their own resources and that usually have a higher income also receive fonds communs, which uh, occasions that this diminishes the resources that can go to uh, the municipalities that need them more. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, Pedro. Now let's welcome Carlos Casas, uh, professor of the economics uh, faculty of the Pacifico University. And after listening to the international vision regarding uh, fiscal decentralization, we would like to know your academic point of view, Carlos. Yes, in the first place, <laughs> I, I'm sorry because I work next to you, but I, I was late, but I was uh, seeing the conference through Facebook. First of all, thank you for the invitation. I think that it's very important to discuss these things because decentralization is having a very low profile during the last years. What we can see is that the emphasis in fiscal decentralization has been, uh, the changes have been very small. And well, how do we see it from the academia or from how do I see it as someone that has followed this process? Well, I see several problems. We have mentioned revenues. That is uh, the place on which I wanted to focus during uh, the first round. In general, what we have is uh, municipalities that depend 75% uh, from transfers uh, re related to the canon, related to the fonds commun, or uh, they are also de they depend also on transfers such as ordinary resource uh, transfers. So what we can see is that there is a very big agenda, but uh, as usual, these aggregated figures or these averages show a lot of heterogeneity because we can see municipalities in Lima that have very low transfer participation, a lot of taxes, and the charging of uh, fees uh, can be obstacles for the competitivity of certain cities, this is pretty high, especially in the urban areas. But in the rural areas, one can see that approximately 90-95% uh, depends, depends on transfers and the capacity to generate owned resources is, is very low. So uh, I think that this uh, must take us to have different policies in which in the Ministry of Economy, we have a classification of municipalities where we can see is that it is demanded uh, to have uh, annual reports regarding fiscal management to a group of 198 municipalities in which we can establish uh, and debt, uh, debt ratios, uh, some uh, ratios that are associated to compliance with fiscal rules because as you know, uh, these 198 municipalities are responsible for almost 100% of the debt of the subnational governments, such as municipalities mainly. So what we can, we have to have different strategies. And I have always asked myself, what is the uh, sense of having 190, 50 uh, tributary uh, admi uh, tax administrations to? Um, collect 1.5 of our taxes in the countries. So we have Sunat that collects most of the, the, the taxes. So why do we have the, the other bodies that connect very little taxes? So maybe we could consolidate a provincial administration for this because some cities have SAT, like Huancayo, like Trujillo. Uh, this could uh, serve as the uh, provincial uh, collection agency I think that this could be really profitable for scale economies. And a uh, topic that we're always discussing, that uh, regarding regional governments, is the uh, inexistent financial autonomy. When we see the budget, sometimes the figures are, are um, confuse us because we, we see that 20 or 15% is decentralized. But actually, the regions don't generate their own resources. Most of the budget comes from transfers uh, related to health and education uh, to finance the current expenditure of uh, in health and education. So the autonomy of regional governments is very low and the degree of fiscal responsibility as well. 
So an alternative that always generates debate, but that could be discussed in the forums, is associated to delegating some uh, authority to them. Not give them all of the taxes, but starting little by little. And one of the taxes that could be uh, transferred is the uh, income tax for um, people. Because when, when one sees the distribution, it uh, is related to the GDP of the departments because when we talk about uh, legal personas, we can see that it's concentrated in Lima because the fiscal address is in Lima. But when we talk about natural people, no, it's not this way. So this could generate a win-win scheme in the sense that uh, collection for those taxes are very low and avoidance is very high. And uh, uh, regional governments could have a uh, possibility of fighting against tax uh, evasion uh, and do a controlling uh, actions, carry out controlling actions with Sunat that could uh, collect. It doesn't mean that we can generate that will we'll generate 24 tax administrations, but uh, Sunat can do it. For example, for the people of Lambayeque. So this greater um, control. Uh, means that if you are closer to the population, this doesn't imply only benefits, it al also implies some costs. And these costs are to have information on where is the population, where are the people that avoid taxes. If we are closer to the people, we can have more control, more awareness campaigns, and this would augment um, fiscal pressure. And uh, maybe this could go through the original administrations. So in this case, we are uh, making the cake bigger, improving collection in departments, and we could also improve our regional um, government's finances. So what we have is that at a, at a regional uh, level, we have this proposal that has always had a lot of opposers and also people that support it. But at a local lev level, I think that there are a, l a lot of things that we can work on regarding the development of uh, scale economies uh, related to collection and effective mechanisms to generate a greater tax collection. Here in Lima, and I'm sincere with you, I always do the following exercise. I get notifications to pay my uh, housing tax, but <laughs> I don't pay it uh, because I actually collect, t I, I receive tax papers all of the year and then I pay it in the end of the year and, and I don't pay any fines for this. And I'm talking about the, the Surco municipality that is a very good one regarding uh, tax collection, but this is a prejudice for uh, good taxpayers because some people in my family, for example, pay house and taxes uh, very early. They have a, a discount, they have a very small discount. But and, and it, well, what I'm trying to say is that um, tax administration don't have good enforcement. They need to improve their administration. And something that I would like to talk about later is the human capital that we are using, because they sometimes don't have the abilities and the knowledge to improve ad tax administration at a subnational level. And on the other side, the expenditure side. On the other hand, the expenditure side that I wanted to mention later. Thank you. Now we're going to have Edgardo Cruzado. We have a lot of challenges. We still have a lot of challenges. And we have mentioned during the first panel the joint uh, work between the three levels of governments, the need of coordination, articulation. And in that sense, we see that uh, work has been started through the executive GORES. And we know that up to now, there have been six GORES. And what has been announced during the last one is that we have more than 400 uh, commitments. So we would like to ask you, Edgardo, what do you consider are the main commitments that have been adopted and implemented uh, that contributes strongly to improving public finance management in subnational governments. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the invitation mm, from our decentralization office. Uh, having these discussion spaces is very important. Is very important. Uh, we work in uh, intergovernmental coordination with three different uh, players. One is the executive Gore. We have here the governors of Lambayeque and Apurímac. 
Uh, then we have national government that works with the national governments in uh, space of the executive gorgeous. And we also have a space uh, that is uh, big cities. Like, for example, the mayor of Trujillo that is here with us. We have a specific work with the uh, main 33 Peruvian cities with more than 200,000 inhabitants or uh, department capitals that have a particular logic. For this panel, I asked to receive the PFAS. Uh, public expenditure and financial accountability. I have read the one from Trujillo, Cusco, Abancay in particular. And a uh, third element we work on is coordination and the uh, all the municipalities of Peru. So we have a space that is called the Executive Munis that are uh, a space for municipalities and national government. First objective is to uh, avoid meeting in Lima. Uh, a rural mayor travels four times per month to Lima to uh, follow a project. So behind the uh, transfer, there's a process of local national interaction that is very costly for the state and very costly for the citizens. Uh, a mayor, if he wants, he or she wants to have a water and sanitation project, needs 36 interactions per project and that's cost for citizens. We want to decrease those costs by uh, seeking a more efficient administration. And that goes to finance issues. I'd like to focus on two important topics in the GORI and also the result of PIFA. One thing is to relate decentralization and service quality. A uh, specificity in the PIFA document I read is that the service indicator, no matter if finance is quite orderly, even with little planning, is that there is very little relationship between finance and service. In the three reports, they all say, with four indicators for relationship between finance and service, that four of the four indicators in two municipalities have the D level, the lowest level. So there is a problem in which the budget part does not talk to the service part. So what do we do at GORE and in the Munis Ejecutivos? We try to agree between the executive branch and the subnational governments in, in things that, are, that impact the quality of service to citizens. So we agree on key matters and on specific terms. Not all commitments are the same. For example, in large cities, we're trying to uh, shorter, shorten the gaps between what is uh, programmed in the budget and executed in the budget from the budget is from 10 to 40 and want to decrease that to a half. So that gap is very high and we want to lower it. That's one transformation. I hope Carl helps us, but it's uh, a three to four year transformation. It's not immediate, but it is a transformation that will truly change the rules of the game of decentralization. In the short term, we do have some specific commitments that uh, can be changed, uh, uh, can change things in the very short term. Uh, the governor of, of Langbayeke can correct me, but we have been installing a commission to strengthen decentralization and the specific issue there is that we can't have districts where we can't pick up uh, uh, garbage or waste and if there is a government with better competence why shouldn't that government assume that so the center is a citizen if the center is a citizen administration adapts to supplying services to citizens I wanted to close this part by saying that our objective is to relate uh, decentralization and quality of services so that the decentralization uh, process is not how we divide the country, but also how the government, the mayor, and the um, national government uh, uh, are able to improve services for citizens. The indicator of success of Gori, Muni, or any process is improvement of services to citizens. The PEFA will help us very much if we uh, link it much more to analyzing uh, finances and results with citizens. And Martin, about uh, the PEFAS, I'd like uh, you to comment if there is some kind of 
complement or supplement between um, the international standards and uh, PIFA. Thank you very much, Julia. We understand that we have to work all together. And this event is a super example of this. Uh, we see all the colleagues are working together here. So we have the PIFA method, we have the OECD standards, we, we have the OECD reforms, so I'd like to, to show you that um, all those are complementary. There is no duplication, there is no contradiction among those things. I'll simplify a little bit. Uh, the PIFA considers a qualification of the PFM uh, systems in a super structured uh, way. It is a very sophisticated and structured system. Now, the OECD recommendations are more based upon good practices. Those differences are also uh, because the style of reform is very different. I must say that the PIFA prioritizes uh, having a um, clear and concise uh, um, overview of the strengths and weaknesses of the public sector um, actions. And the OECD uh, is more interested in the links uh, among the different areas of the public government and financial management. Also with OECD officials, we have tried to show the complexity of promoting a change. <coughs> and, however, it is clear for me that all the methodologies become strengthened and enriched when uh, working together. Also, PIFA indicators can provide a clear guidance for selecting priorities, and OECD recommendations are more to help identify what and how things should change. In, in any way, all the work of PIFA and the OECD recommendations can be useful only if they are used by you and for your country. They are useful only if they are used in difficult decision making. In, like, for example, you have to, uh, to decide when you have very limited uh, financial and human resources. And also, to see what is the best way to progress in Peru. However, in international organizations, uh, as we know, we have to be humble. Uh, no one can uh, understand completely all the public and financial policies, all the uh, region uh, players, all the local players. However, we uh, think that we can contribute to that debate in the future years. Uh, we see progress in Peru, and I personally uh, hope that Peru will soon intensify its accession process. And uh, I'm very glad to, to have this opportunity, my, my, that my team has this opportunity of participating uh, in this project uh, of the Basel Institute supported by SECO. Thank you, Martin. And uh, we talked a while ago about the challenges we have concerning uh, fiscal decentralization. Uh, we understand that uh, at, at the World Bank there is a methodology called mi gestión, my management, to um, overcome this problem. Can you explain this? Yes, of course. We haven't applied it in Peru, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you from the start. Mi gestión, my management, is a management tool for municipal governments or cities. It's a program for 
self-diagnose and self-evaluation. It has some um, five key points of a mayor's management. You get a scorecard and um, monitoring um, uh, um, chart for mayors to look at. First of all, uh, citizen service, service to citizens. That's the first uh, way to uh, talk uh, um, about uh, the different uh, BIFA indicators in OECD standards. We have to think first that public finances are an instrument, not an objective. So that, um, that objective is service to citizens. Um, these are some of the things we have um, worked on, like for example, services and procedures. We have evaluated how municipalities are dealing with this, and uh, particularly procedures procedures not only for homes but also for companies. The second uh, thing we evaluate, and that's very interesting, is collection. Collection of taxes, fees, and so on. How friendly is it? How efficient is it? Uh, then you go to the back office, to the kitchen, you see the dirty laundry, and you start to check if, for example, the multi-purpose cadaster is working or not, now, because that's the first input uh, for uh, improving collection, and very important for an efficient management of uh, land allocation, and also for managing risks when there are floods and so on. So. Then you go to a different module, which is planning and coordination of planning with specific targets that mayors have um, on a quarterly basis. And finally, we start with the systems we mentioned this morning, which are part of the back office that is evaluating the process of buying um, goods and services also evaluating the personnel, um, training, turnover, and management of uh, human resources, also managing uh, assets and liabilities and inventories. This is a very simple system uh, that can be adapted for municipalities uh, according to their uh, functions in their specific place. There is uh, an application of this in Colombia. We are working with 300 municipalities that is led by the National Planning uh, Department. Um, from there, we will see that uh, the municipalities that decide to use these tools should share this with the central authority so someone can integrate how processes are functioning and propose solutions or support programs. Um, in the case of Colombia, it's through national planning. Thank you, Pedro. We continue receiving questions through uh, the internet. There is a question for Carlos. The question is, how can you generate your own resources at regional uh, governments? Well, our proposal is to transfer um, collection of uh, uh, the income tax uh, of um, individuals. It's not a big fiscal um, cost for us, and it has great potential. So there is something we should review uh, in that uh, area. Um, there are other transfer uh, proposals also, but there is a concept which is fiscal responsibility. If you don't generate uh, revenues and you live only of transfers, uh, that limits responsible management of public finance because the game is limited to asking the central government for more and more transfers, and that uh, um, wears you out politically. So um, regional governments uh, need to emphasize generation of uh, their own resources. When we started 
with the decentralization uh, process, there is always a discussion between economists and lawyers. Uh, for uh, economists, it's taxes, and for lawyers, it's taxes, uh, fees, and contributions. Uh, and we have to modify the constitution so they, that uh, uh, local or regional governments could collect fees. Um, well, uh, if you go uh, and check what um, a regional government gets as income, you see it's very little. And uh, also, since they aren't so close to the population, you won't be able to see um, what is the quality of their public service. So, um, this would be a national uh, budget collected by Sunat, but according to where the person is domiciled, that would be transferred to that um, regional government so they can increase their income. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, you mentioned a while ago that you wanted to refer to uh, expenditure in terms of fiscal management. Yes, I've also participated in one PIFA evaluation at a regional government. And uh, what we see there, uh, in theory, when you check the legal framework of decentralization and you say, oh, great, it responds to the principle of fiscal responsibility, it's not bad. Um, <coughs> there is a, a schedule or a timeline for transferring competences, etc. But the problem was implementation. The last thing to be transferred uh, was to be health and education. We had to learn along the way, and health and education are complex. But in the former government, they decided to transfer competences. And the indicator was how many transfers or of the 4,000 and something had been transferred. That does not give any indication of quality. I can transfer from one day to the other uh, by decree, but um, without money, that's a problem. So that is something that we have to take into account. Now, the issue is in the hands of operators. When you see reconstruction with changes, for example, you can see that um, tender documents are not well done, that tenders are not well done, and then um, they're stopped. All the processes are stopped. So we need human resources. <coughs> so we need to uh, change some expenditure rules. On the other hand, I work with local governments in a department in Peru uh, by um, advising them. And it's like you mentioned, to carry out the sanitation work in the district, the mayor has to come once a week to Lima. That's a loss of time and money. Uh, sometimes um, the, the, the people say, where the hell is the mayor? And everybody says, well, he's in Lima, but in Lima no one hears him, etc. So we have to go to the ministries and tell them, uh, okay, tell the guy yes or no, but it's not like maybe, maybe, maybe 1,000 times. And we have to work on a number of issues concerning management, treasury, uh, budget, also with investment multi-annual, uh, the, the investment multi-annual uh, tool that's important. Control has become a bit relaxed, we can discuss about that. But this multi-annual um, tool helps us to coordinate expenditures a long time and also cater for uh, the closing of gaps. When we work with the mayors, um, they, they, sh they tell us that, uh, well, at the national level, mayors are seen as inefficient and corrupted. And that's what you hear in, in national management. But when you see things from the mayor's point uh, of view, uh, we see that there is a lot of discoordination between local levels and national levels, loss of time, um, 
bad resource allocation, too much uh, discretion, that generates problems to who? To citizens, because of fight between all the different governments, local, regional, national, etc. All those things harm citizens. And I wanted to insist in a number of issues here. Here at the university, we have done a number of studies and we have seen that the level of efficiency in the expenditure affects um, the people, health, security, internal order, etc. We can see that the indicators affect uh, indebtedness, fiscal deficit related to fiscal rules. There's a pending agenda there. We have to improve the quality of public services because that will help us improve our financial I indicators because what we have is a big infrastructure uh, gap in a number of places, but we see there are no resources. Then we have an al alternative, PPPs, but uh, there is a PPP here and the capacity of a local or regional government is here. There's a big gap between them. And the ideal thing is that cities should be independent, that should issue some instrument in the capital market to collect resources with all the necessary controls at a national level to finance infrastructure and not this practice we see today. In some cities, I have seen this. There are many investment projects, and if there are two million, let's say, I give 50,000 uh, solace to each project. The population is happy, you start, you have a budget, but in the end it's inefficient allocation of resources. The next year is 50,000 solace again, so there are partial advancements just to have the people happy, but you are not prioritizing by making the infrastructure works the city needs. Another thing is transfers. The system of transfers in Peru, the canon, this mining royalty, has generated a lot of fiscal inequality. Many districts have a lot of resources per capita and other districts have none. Per citizen in San Marcos, the municipality received 28,000 soles, for example. In Amazonas, when there, where there is no canon, they received 20 cents. So there is a big um, disparity there, and this is being compensated through transfers of ordinary or of current uh, resources. These are the typical transfers of ministries to municipalities. I hope the practice um, that um, had uh, expenditures in September when it had not been spent uh, they transfer to local governments. So the ministry improved in in their uh, improved in their um, indicators. But at the end of the year, they say, "Well, the regional government, the local government, didn't spend the money." Well, uh, they didn't spend the money because they were given the money on September. We should have rules, transparency, predictability in resource transfer. I think that's very important. This has decreased, but to, uh, some years ago, this was a very serious problem. On the other hand, the transfer system has a problem. They are generating the creation of more districts. We have many districts in Peru, and there's one more, for example, Ch uh, Charati or Megantoni. They are generating a new district, and what's the incentive there? The poorest area wants to open its own district because they will receive more money like that. And there was an agreement in Congress, I remember in the last decade, that there was a tacit agreement about not creating more districts. The last time I did a study for the IDB on municipalities, well, we saw that five districts had been created last year, two years ago, sorry. <coughs> so there is an incentive of uh, atomizing the country. What we should have is mechanisms to integrate the country and um, having economies of scale. Thank you, Carlos. Um, all, everything that you say is very interesting. We continue receiving questions through um, the internet, and um, the people want to know about 
these two important commitments concerning the executive goddess. The first one referred to creating a um, task force to evaluate uh, the competences of the three levels of government. Understand that this commitment was adopted on the fourth gore. And on the sixth gore, there is also a commitment about creating a technical committee for decentralization. So citizens want to know what are the progresses made uh, concerning the implementation of um, these uh, commitments and what's their objective. Well, first of all, I want to answer about uh, the GORES mechanics. These are quarterly meetings between governors and ministers. So regional governors can meet um, the ministers uh, they need to meet with, or vice versa, if ministers need to meet um, um, governors. We, we, we will have one in March with 200 meetings. A governor usually meets seven or eight ministers. Those meetings generate a number of specific agreements. We call them commitments. They, they are around 400 and 500 commitments. We, we try to monitor them specifically also on a quarterly basis. There are larger and lesser commitments. Um, we are at 73% of compliance with these commitments and we're fine tuning all this because commitments and how they are uh, written can be simple like just meeting or solving the problem. <laughs> That's too general. So we are learning to debate uh, based upon um, specific issues. So we have 400 mayors meet with 40 to 50 um, heads of programs in an executive gore, and there are many commitments that uh, come out from that. The idea is to comply with these commitments. We have to account for them. We have to record them. That's a practice we need to uh, carry out. <coughs> the second thing is what you're asking. Uh, this is a concern we have. Decentralization, I mean, the, the, the decentralization's objective is quality of service to citizens no matter where they live in the territory. The territory is a very important va va variable. When I read the PEFAS, for example, the Abancay PEFA, uh, it, that means that it's a city. We all know Abancay is a city. Uh, the people who see us through streaming um, will acknowledge that Abancay is the capital department of the Apurima uh, department, and it has two districts. If we have a PIFA that includes only the finance of one district, we are having a problem. We are blind of one eye. Sometimes uh, uh, we, we do this kind of thing, and Martin can help us with the international experience, but we have to coordinate public administration with the territory's characteristics and the specificities of uh, territorial spaces. We're making a serious effort with CEPLAN, PCM, the international cooperation to incorporate the territorial component um, to uh, our work. This means that we have to think not in terms of laws and standards only or regulations. They are very important. It's basic, of course, but we have to talk about results on people. In the fourth uh, executive gore, which we installed uh, on Wednesday, we installed a commission to agree at the three government levels to divide functions in central processes. We want to specifically analyze um, uh, um, supply of uh, school materials at the beginning of the uh, school period. Uh, in this case, in this year, it's March 7th. Each government has to assume a responsibility. The local government will help us to have the books reach the children from the UGEL. But the regional government receives the books in the 
uh, regional director uh, directorate or the uh, uh, regional UGEL, and they have to facilitate transportation. The same thing goes with antibiotics, for example. For an amoxicillin to reach a specific health post, we need logistics, someone responsible for procurement, someone responsible for management, logistics, and also restocking if it's um, it's um, already exhausted, etc. So we have to build those processes and find where the bottlenecks are. We cannot program every year, uh, build 45 or 50 um, schools in a district because our budget is for 10, because we generate big conflicts between national, regional, and local levels. We need to prioritize by agreeing and defining uh, what is a priority, uh, and then we can help. It's not an easy task. We're looking for good practices. We're trying to negotiate and agree. But we have a pre-agreement with governors, and that's uh, clear. Water issues are very local, but in infrastructure, we need a multi-annual regional planning, um, planning mechanism that we can all share. In health, we had a great experience about scheduling investments. We would like to see applied in other ministries also. Financial mechanisms have to go hand in hand with this. They should not be um, um, apart from priorities. They have to be coordinated. Another important thing, and here I'd like to congratulate um, the people for their efforts, is the importance of these tools for uh, transferring government. This year we have elections. We have to elect our new mayors, our new governors, and there we share with governors and mayors a central concern. We want to make sure that finance structures and operations in regional governments are at their best. So that the person that has to assume as from the end of this year uh, can have everything uh, at hand so they can start working right away. So there's big effort uh, with Servir. Uh, it's very simple. I don't know how this happens in other countries, but um, the budget cycle in Peru ends on December 31st. Every December 31st, the administration closes one day and um, and opens and reopens uh, uh, on the first day of the next month, uh, on the 1st of January. For example, we'll have a new mayor. And what this mayor will find is that none of the workers in the municipality uh, have a contract because the contract ended the day before. It's a detail, but it affects quality of service on January 1st. The mayor has no one to pick up the garbage with. Now, it's something that we should change. It's a shared responsibility with uh, national central government. And um, um, they acknowledge it as, uh, as such. So in our Gores and our Munis, uh, the current uh, authorities are concerned about uh, leaving uh, current administrations in the best uh, condition possible. In 2018, uh, to make these standards um, um, sustainable, uh, we still need to do a lot of work. Uh, there are efforts made on 11 local and regional governments that uh, will uh, sh um, teach us some lessons that, that uh, we will use for better managing resources for our citizens. Thank you very much mm, for your excellent uh, participation. We have big challenges ahead, as you can see, in the process of strengthening public finance in subnational governments. Part of this pending agenda will be tackled with in the following panel. Uh, the panel has had many likes, so these are virtual claps. Now I would like face-to-face uh, uh, -face claps for our uh, panelists.
Now we invite you to a coffee break and then we continue with the next panel. Uh, we're going to have our picture taken.
we're going to go back to our intense rhythm. If you need uh, headphones to listen to the uh, interpretation, you can uh, take them uh, outside because some of the um, presentations are going to be in English, okay? Okay, Martin. Uh, welcome, uh, everybody, to this last panel. Uh, we have four uh, panelists that are highly qualified. On my left, I have James Croman Christensen. He is the director in charge of uh, the PEFA Secretariat. He has come from the United States, from Washington, D.C., to be here with us. Thank you very much, James. Then we have Lucho Vela, who is the general manager of the general government of the regional government of San Martin. Then we have Andreas Bergman. Andreas is the director of the uh, Public uh, Management Institute in the uh, University of Applied Sciences in Zurich, Switzerland. And finally, we have Carlos Oliva. You know, you all know him. He is a former Vice Minister of Finance and he directs the Master's Degree of Public Management here at Pacifico University. He is also uh, a leader in our uh, Public Finance uh, Management Program. I would like to start this panel with a question to the uh, director of the PEFA Secretariat, James. We have heard in previous panels about PEFA. I am not sure that everyone in the room knows what uh, it is about. So can you please tell us what is uh, PEFA's role, what is a PEFA evaluation, and what are the specific characteristics that have to be taken into account in a PEFA evaluation at a national level. Muchas gracias. Y antes de que empiece a responder a la pregunta, quisiera eh, agradecer al Perú por comprometerse en este ejercicio tan ambicioso de evaluar y eh, ver la gestión de finanzas públicas a nivel subnacional en 11 eh, unidades, probablemente sea un récord mundial. También quisiera felicitar a la Universidad del Pacífico y a SECO por eh, patrocinar y, y hacer este esfuerzo inmenso y me gustaría eh, agradecer a mi equipo que ha leído 11 reportes y ha leído 2000 páginas dos veces eh, y que se han vuelto mejores personas por ello. El marco PEFA es un marco analítico, es una asociación entre SECO, NORED, el eh, FMI, el Banco Mundial, Francia y DIFET. Ha estado presente desde los años 2000 y durante ese periodo PEFA, uh, PEFA uh, ha sido tomado uh, 570 veces y 240 de estas veces ha sido a nivel subnacional. Eh, y ha sido hecho eh, a todos los niveles nacional y subnacional por tres o cuatro años eh, para poder ver el progreso. Eh, el año pasado se hizo uh, 26 PEFAS subnacionales. El PEFA eh, tiene varios propósitos y aquellos que han pasado por el ejercicio PEFA están familiarizados eh, con esos eh, 90 a 100 indicadores que miden el desempeño. Drill down instruments in tax or in formulation or in reporting that you get the the overall picture and end up with a heat map 
um, it with scores from A to D uh, and can identify w where the problems are, the pressure points are, and where the strengths are, if you will. Um, we do feel, we see an increasing interest in doing PFAS at subnational level, and there are a number of reasons for doing that. Um, firstly, um, there is this focus, as we heard in the previous uh, sec sessions, on PFM and service delivery, not just looking at budgeting for the sake of budgeting, but looking at budgeting and it, its impact on service delivery. And that obviously means looking at local uh, subnational levels of government, because that's where most service delivery takes place. Um, PIFA was developed for uh, assessments at national level, but it has proven to be a very useful and applicable instrument at the subnational level as well. Uh, a third reason is uh, that many countries want to inform decentralization reforms. I think the previous panel in particular showed that there is much more to this reform agenda than is captured by the individual subnational PFAS, but it is an important element uh, in that dialogue. Um, and finally, we see that some subnationals are beginning to want to undertake PFAS themselves to, um, to, uh, to project a positive image of their own government to attract business and, uh, and, and capital. So obviously, P Peru now stands out with, uh, with these 11, uh, 11 uh, assessments. Uh, and I think uh, I wish you best of, of luck with that going forward. Thank you. <coughs> Muchas gracias, Jens. Creo que queda claro que un PFA es una labor intensa, eh, holística, abarcando muchas áreas de la gestión de finanzas públicas para obtener un diagnóstico, una radiografía realmente del, del estado de las finanzas públicas en los gobiernos que se evalúan. Eh, quisiera ahora pasar... Eh, Andreas Bergman, que es un experto asociado de SECO y que tiene eh, experiencia en la gestión de finanzas públicas en muchos países, muchos países también de la región. Y me gustaría saber de Andreas eh, cuál ha sido la experiencia de eh, tu experiencia con evaluaciones a nivel subnacional, evaluaciones PFA a nivel subnacional en otros países de la región. Muchas gracias. Efectivamente, como, como ya eh, discutimos, es un instrumento para mejorar la gestión de finanzas públicas. Este es el, el objetivo de, de hacer al, el análisis. Es, es un análisis formativo para mejorar y para definir los próximos pasos. Um, mi compañero uh, por la derecha que um, es casi único que hay 11 gobiernos subnacionales en el mismo ejercicio. Entonces no puedo compartir ninguna experiencia a nivel de, de una participación. Uh, in, I, I cannot share an, an experience uh, of that kind in any Latin American country. Normally it is one subnational government participating and this has to do with a new mayor or with a new governor or with a new uh, chief for financial services that wants to uh, get information on what are the strengths uh, but also the weaknesses in his or her system. An example from my own country, and sometimes we say that PEFA is only for uh, developing countries, but actually it's not true, because in land, uh, the state of Lucerna used it to define its priorities after uh, electing a new uh, Minister of Finances. So this is a good example of how it can be used. Here in Peru we have an advantage, a huge advantage, that is to have right now 11 uh, results uh, and this advantage means that we can analyze in comparison with other uh, very similar governments. Of course the results are not dramatically different but there are some differences. So it is possible to learn how we can improve through small steps uh, by doing comparisons with other governments in the same country. And finally, I think that it is very important in a situation such as a Peruvian situation that is a unitary decentralized country to involve uh, 
national entities because many of the uh, greatest challenges can all can only be solved uh, together with the national government so i think that it is a very good idea to involve the national government in events such as this event but also in the work that we do or that is done thank you very much andreas I think that indeed we must uh, underline that this is not only a diagnosed instrument for developing countries, but it's also useful for analyzing countries that uh, have uh, great experience and better economy, such as Norway, uh, that has analyzed uh, the state of their public finances of their public finances through this methodology. I think this is a very important uh, item. So after having the international vision, we're going to get closer uh, to the country. We're going to talk about Peru. Carlos, you have had an experience, a very close experience with PIFA evaluations. You have had the titanesque work of leading 11 PIFA evaluations at a subnational level. Uh, we have heard that you have read uh, 2,200 pages that you have read, but you have also written, supervised. So tell us a little bit about your experience with these 11 evaluations and with the main results. Thank you very much, Martin. Before answering directly your question, uh, for all of the people that are connected to social media, I would like to tell you that these evaluations will be uh, soon put on the uh, GFP subnational webpage and we will also coordinate it with the PEFA secretary so that the uh, secretariat webpage is, uh, has these evaluations. We have finalized 10 of them and we are going uh, to finish number 11, that is with the regional government of Piura. To the people present, I think that you have received a USB a key where their uh, evaluations, where these evaluations are um, included, and so that you can read these 2,000 pages these we this weekend. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is a uh, disposition or the readiness that subnational authorities have had to uh, do these evaluations. These evaluations come from a request of governors or mayors that want to uh, go through this evaluation with an internationally accepted methodology. And this is really very positive. Uh, not everybody wants to be evaluated. And the fact that mayors and governors have asked us for us expressly, they want to be uh, evaluated on this methodology, I think that this is something that has to be underlined and we have to thank local authorities for this. Furthermore, after obtaining results, the 10 governments, uh, governors or mayors uh, have given us uh, approval so that these um, studies are um, given to the public uh, because in other countries what happens is that they ask for the evaluation they see the results and then the government says well you better not publish it you better put in a drawer so i would like also to underline this readiness uh, for transparency in uh, national and regional authorities that have allowed us to publish the evaluations uh, that will be uh, soon available for everyone regarding results uh, the fact that we have done 10 evaluations simultaneous, simultaneously allows us to do some general conclusions. Uh, first of all, almost 70% of indicators at a regional level and almost 60% of indicators at a local level are similar. They have the same qualification, good or bad but they have the same qualification. I don't know if this is common in other countries, but here I think that it is a reflection of the great uh, power of administrative uh, systems that uh, rule public finance, ma public finance management. The fact that qualifications are similar is reflecting 
is that these entities, these bodies, are following the guidelines that are dictated by uh, ruling uh, bodies. Maybe it is good, sometimes it is good, sometimes it is bad, uh, because sometimes they get an A and sometimes they get a D. So this influence that governing bodies have on uh, public finance management is something that is not unimportant. And, of course, it um, gives more responsibility to governing bodies to keep improving their own systems because what this is telling us is that what is uh, said in the central government has, an I as has a sure impact in a unitary country uh, as Peru in uh, regional and municipal governments. So this is first thought I wanted to share with you. So this is a percentage, 60 or 70. The rest... Uh, presents indicators in which there are differences uh, among the different uh, units. There, are n there is no local or regional government that is really above uh, another one or above the others. What we have found is that in some cases the regional government has good practices, in others it doesn't, and the local government can have uh, opposite qualifications in the same case. So there is no one that really stands out. Uh, in some cases we have good practices in one area and in other cases we have good practices in other areas. This is a very important conclusion because what it means is that there is someone that is doing things better than, than me. So this is precisely the kind of element, the kind of element that has to be taken into account by local and regional r leaders to improve their public finance management. So if I read my own evaluation, I see I have a C, and that at the same time I know that another uh, government has an A, well I know that I can improve myself, and I, can, I could even have a collaboration with the government that has a good practice so that they help me to improve my own qualification my own score and my own management. So I think that is a very important element. If we look at specific topics where um, they all show standards below the international uh, standard is something that has been repeated in previous panels. Uh, I'm talking about the predictability and reliability of budget. Peru is one of the countries in which what is available to be spent is 20-25% higher generally than what is approved the uh, year before by Congress. In uh, PIM is 20 or 25% higher than what was approved. Uh, this calls our attention because uh, when we talk about uh, people from the OCDE, this is not very normal, but here it is a practice. I don't know if uh, I could call this a bad practice, but in any case, it is a practice that does not correspond to international standards. So this brings a lot of problems. First problem, number of uh, budget modifications that are done during the year. In the program, we have an indicator in which we do follow up to these modifications. And even if you don't believe it, we have subnational governments that do three to 4,000 modifications per year. Can you imagine this? <laughs> if you take in into account uh, Saturdays and Sundays, this means that you have 10 modifications per day, maybe beca because we had external resources, or because I am changing my budget, or because I'm changing my priorities. So, first of all, this is a huge uh, job for uh, budget managers, but it also shows that our planning, the previous, uh, the, the, the part before our budgeting, is still very weak. We have heard Javier Abogatas in the beginning telling us about everything that is being done now to improve this articulation, and uh, we hope that in the short term we will start having uh, results because a better uh, planning will of course be reflected in a budget that will vary less and that will be more credible and more predictable. 
Another topic that has been mentioned uh, and that needs improving has to do with uh, procurement or buying. Uh, in many cases, there are still processes that are not competitive uh, for works, for public works. Uh, these are there are a few of them, but there are two or three subnational governments in where direct administration method is still uh, valid, and this is not very competitive. So this can be and should be improved. There are topics that have to do with financial reporting that aren't done in the periods in which uh, they should be done according to international regulation. There are um, big problems in general, and this happens to at the national level, with the, uh, with the property registry. And well, uh, maybe I could talk about this in more detail, but the fact that we don't have a uh, governing body for procurement is a very Im important problem that does that the management of of uh, storage and patrimony is still uh, lacking. There are topics in which we have weaknesses too, such as internal control. That is a weakness. The analysis has been done uh, on the years 2013 to 2015 because when we have done the evaluation in 2016, we have taken these three years and we have seen that internal control is very weak. And when we talk about internal control, we're talking about managing uh, risks and uh, financial administration of subnational governments. They told us at the beginning that the controller's office is trying to work on internal control, so we hope that we will see changes in the future. But uh, control systems are still very weak, external audits uh, also. Uh, this is another topic that has been mentioned. Sometimes there are audits, recommendations are done, and um, there are no answers to these recommendations. Some entities do it, some others uh, monthly or quarterly or annually, and some other entities just do not uh, respond. The last thing that I would like to mention too is the role of uh, subnational legislative bodies in the process of elaborating uh, management tools and especially for budget. And this has to do with national regulation because here budget is approved by Congress and in the end this is almost like an administrative procedure uh, that uh, each ministry has to approve. Uh, international regulations recommend that um, regional or municipal councils should be much more active in formulating budget as in doing follow-up of these budgets. Now the fact that Congress approves uh, budget doesn't free us from having uh, local legislative powers uh, being more active for the benefit of their own towns. Uh, later I can talk more about some recommendations that I would like to uh, mention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. I think that what you are mentioning is very important. The very important role of uh, administrative schemes in um, the government which limit the um, room of maneuver of uh, subnational governments. Evidently a very interesting and valuable uh, job. Also having this gamut of evaluations um, make it makes it possible to have um, an exchange uh, among subnational governments so they can learn uh, ones from the others. We have talked a lot about subnational governments, and now we can finally pass the floor to a representative of uh, um, subnational government, Lucho. This is the second time uh, you go through this um, uh, exercise 
there was one in the San Martin government in 2011 so you very well know this tool what is really the use of this kind of evaluation for a subnational government as the San Martin governor thank you very much and thank you for giving me this chance I'd like to um, salute all my colleagues in subnational governments it's useful if we transform the evaluation in an action plan if not it's just the evaluation for the evaluation and we need to go from evaluation to development of improvement of competences as a function of um, indicators and results so according to that approach uh, in subnational governments we have um, specificities in our territories and we have some coincidences in administrative actions because we are ruled by the uh, national governance systems in the case of San Martin there are no national policies for the Amazon area uh, there is no um, Amazonian development vision and we are 60 percent of the territory in the country so how do we reconvert this tool that uh, leads to administrative action and that motivates political actors because if things are not interesting for political actors it's more of the same so we developed in the framework of a first evaluation a priority action plan to start to respond to political actors expectations that's the first element for governance we have uh, not progressed in the decentralization prog process in the country uh, now we stigmatize all regional governments as thieves and corrupted people that's the that's the perception how can we change change that perception if the organization system has not uh, progressed on governance uh, we only look at the short term and just a little bit of a bit term but we always forget about the long term and uh, to do that we need to organize our governments we just administer according to our best um, knowledge and according to our competences so we needed to improve um, governance and governance competence um, government management in San Martin requires then uh, to take into account priorities and to plan uh, territorial work we have the concerted plan the strategic plan and the operational plan uh, so we decided to uh, develop with students some exercises like management uh, vision um, well the term is just four years in the government so we need to align the institutional strategic plan to uh, elections uh, proposals so the um, um, action plan becomes uh, attractive for political actors perhaps not 100 percent of the effort just 70 percent for example that would make the elections uh, offer um, compatible with uh, governance so the tool helps us to build priorities within that logic we started to feel the need to prioritize interventions like for example in the strategic plan saying that we're going to lower 10% uh, of chronic malnutrition in four years that's crazy but we can develop that if we organize a system and use this tool to uh, improve administrative system organization we were able to do that so the tool should play with uh, the uh, factors in um, on site to improve political action San Martin has developed multi-annual programming since 2013 uh, and we know that we need to prioritize intervention actions 
for social action in our territory. We need to improve malnutrition. That means improving water. To improve water, we need to improve resources. To improve resources, we have an initiative since 2006 concerning uh, tax uh, exemptions in the country. In San Martin, about 300 million are lost in that. Uh, we have reconverted that so it helps us to have predictability towards indebtedness and solve water issues. It's incredible that a city in the jungle has water only three hours per day. Um, the tool told us, well, you can't have access to indebtedness if your financial statements uh, do not, uh, um, are, are not audited. So we had to improve all the accounting system to uh, make um, financial statements, um, opinions more predictable. So the action plan tries to improve the system. How do we organize uh, the investment by aligning to national policies, by prioritizing strategic establishments? In San Martin, there are 36 of those establishments, including six or seven hospitals that are being executed now. So budgetary predictability does not help if we only see 20% more with no institutional correlation to improve the system. All those elements, all those tools have allowed us to have the political authority define prioritization and intervention lines to improve administrative systems. And I think that's extremely important because <coughs> then all the proposal becomes viable. We also started to work on implementing the SIGA. We started with that on 2013. All executing units have this SIGA now. Uh, also, we, s we started working with internal control, improving processes. Um, the idea was to organize the system so it is less vulnerable to corruption. It will be less vulnerable if we start to understand what are the missions, the macro processes, and the internal processes. The political actor is also interested in being less vulnerable to questioning by the population. You see, we add up a number of elements to look for uh, expenditure management efficiency. We will be efficient if we do management by results also budgetary programs that's important and we also generated some experiences to share with CEPLAN and we developed an exercise to improve the efficiency of expenditure in San Martin uh, concerning prioritized uh, programs um, there, we were able to see that there were headings that uh, have more influence on defining a result. Well, that's part of the experience of the PEFA. Uh, there are several tools uh, that require consolidation of actions to help governance. A second space is um, continuous improvement. We can't be stagnant in our systems. We have to generate uh, political motivation to uh, tell everybody, all the political actors, the importance of these tools for transparency, uh, governance, indicators for citizens, multi-annual scheduling or programming, etc. <coughs> so. These have been very interesting, important exercises. 
We have designed uh, roads for 450 kilometers, for example, in San Martin, and it's all paved. Um, and at um, um, good uh, quality cost uh, rate. Uh, we have done this thanks to strengthening also our relationship with the population. In that way we have been able to put pressure, align policies, take a look at our territory because San Martin had 50,000 problems before. They had subversion, we had subversion, Sendero in the south, MRTA in the north. It is known as a drug trafficking region, so the political and social actors needed to change their mindset. That has helped us to, ev um, to learn how to evaluate and build an action plan uh, responding to um, uh, reorientation principles. The region is growing at 6% per year. Last year we had a conversation with the BCR um, towards uh, improving and uh, building governance no matter what difficulties we might have in developing the Amazon area. Within that logic, it's been important for us to build this tool. And it can be important if we decide to build all this system with the indicators uh, Carlos mentioned to us. OK, good, a good ra round of applause. Lucho, you have eloquently and clearly talked about the evaluation and how it has helped you prioritize um, to think in the mid and long term to finally supply better quality public services and guarantee access of people to quality public services. That's the idea, precisely. As several lecturers have said this morning, it might seem something very theoretical, but actually it's very concrete. Because that's the base for education, health, access to potable water, etc. I'd like to go back a little bit to the PEFA exercise. Jens, you said this. The PEFA Secretariat has been very close to those 11 PEFA evaluations in the last 12 months. And I think uh, we have also used a different methodology uh, to collect those uh, data. Uh, can you comment what lessons you have learned uh, for the Secretariat uh, stemming from this exercise? Muchas gracias. Gracias a mis uh, colegas panelistas por... I realize, watching the big screen, that I forgot to thank the Bethel Institute as well. I, I believe you had a hand in these PFAS as well. Uh, the role of the PFAS Secretariat uh, for these PFAS is to develop the framework, the analytical framework. It is to provide training, and it is to provide quality assurance for each of the reports that are being undertaken uh, around the world. Um, a brief word on training. Uh, actually, on, on 23rd and 24th, we will be organizing training in Lima, in Lima a, um, a regional training event for the entire Latin America region, and obviously including Peru. So people who would like to join that training uh, should feel free to sign up on the PIFA website. And that will be both for national and sub-national governments. It's a two-day training event um, that will provide an introduction to the framework and will be very, very, very hands-on. Um, and um, I should say this because we, we do these training events all over the world in countries, and we also do it um, do it for regional trainings. The second task of providing quality review really invo involves uh, two things. One is assuring that a proper process is being followed for undertaking the reviews. And secondly, that the final reports 
are live up to quality standards in a, in a number of respects. For, so on the, the process, it's about ensuring that peer reviews are undertaken, that um, data is being collected in the, in, in the right way, that there is a concept note. Uh, and on the report, it's really making sure that there's adequate documentation for, for the ratings, that the ratings are scored in the right way, and that the reports are um, uh, structured and have the content they're supposed to have. And we do this essentially to make sure that they are an accurate, an accurate uh, depiction of PFM in, at the level we're talking about. And we also do it to ensure comparability, improve the, the, uh, the comparability of reports between countries and, 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 and regions. And we are very happy to say that, uh, that um, these 11 uh, reports, they, they have been granted the PIFA check, which is uh, a certification that these reports uh, are at quality. Uh, and we uh, really enjoyed that process uh, a lot. Um, in terms of the uh, the lessons, uh, I think the uh, uh, I think the partnership that we've seen in 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 Peru is an important way of of implementing such a large volume. Um, we still. We're a little bit convinced that, that doing maybe a smaller number to start with and then rolling it out to more, um, more units afterwards would have been a good idea uh, instead of going all the way with all reports at the same time because there are some lessons learned from that, that could have been applied uh, to, to subsequent reports. If, say, two regions went first and then we did the subsequent nine, maybe we could have learned a little bit on that. And that is something we will incorporate in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in our lessons learned. Um, uh, but overall, this is very high quality, and we consider this very good practice. Um, and um, we're also very happy that the reports will be made public. In that sense, we feel that will that will really make them much more useful. Um, I was very gratified by the by the comments from my panelists from San Martin uh, about the use of the PIFA reports, because in many ways the work has just started or begun, if you will. Uh, the real test of whether this is valuable, uh, use of your time and uh, Swiss funding, is uh, whether these reports are being good put to, to good use in, uh, in Peru and in these, uh, these 11 counties and beyond, uh, subnational units, uh, to improve understanding uh, and to bring about a discussion of priorities. I think the panels today have showed there's so many things to do from civil service reform to inequality in the distribution formula results to availability of refunds to public investment management to the, the list I started taking note, I, I stopped at 10, I think. And I think there is, there, there, what I take away without knowing Peru a lot is that there will be a need for prioritizing, coming up with reforms, agreeing on which level of government can do, can do what. Uh, it's about bringing the stakeholders together and, and ultimately focusing on the on, on the impact. So the work has just started, and I think you're off to a very good start. Um, I would like to reflect a little bit on colleagues from the OECD, Martin Frost, who mentioned that uh, that uh, we need to look at the bigger picture, and I think that's one of the lessons we are taking away, not from PIFA in in Peru, but from PIFAs internationally. They typically fail if users forget that PIFA is only one part of the picture. Uh, there's so many other things around it that are super duper important. So that needs to be taken into account when uh, reform act action plans are being, uh, be being delivered. And never forgetting the ultimate beneficiaries of this, which are the citizens that should receive services and infrastructure to go about their lives in, in, in an enhanced way. So you mentioned the previous uh, PIFA uh, round in 2012-2013, and I, I can't remember the number, but it was, not an, it was about the same number of PIFAs that were undertaken in that time. And I think it would be uh, a good idea to reflect on that exercise, what came out of that, what worked well, what didn't work well, what can be done even better this time in terms of making sure that they are uh, uh, they're put to good use. So, those would be my reflections. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias, Jens. Eh, creo que sí, un, algunas lecciones muy importantes. Eh, tú has mencionado que el secretariado hace un, un cierto quality check. And uh, there is an important role in peer reviewers there. 
and one of those peer reviewers has been Andreas Bergman. Andreas, you have also had to read all the 2,200 pages taking a look at all the PFAS and the, well you made comments and you have the experience from other countries in other subnational governments that had gone through the same exercise. So, from your standpoint, what are the strengths but also the weaknesses in managing public finances in subnational governments in Peru? Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure to read these documents because they were uh, very high of a very high quality. The Basel Institute uh, prepared all these documents. I didn't have many comments actually, and this is due to um, the um, task that they undertook diligently with a great quality. The main strength in Peru is that many reforms uh, have been made and that uh, public finance management has made great progress at national level and now at subnational level for some time now. So from my point of view, Peru is a, an advanced country in this regard. The people are reading the report and say, well, there are many C's and D's here, so it's not an advanced country. And, uh, however, we have to realize that A, B, C, D are not measuring the necessary investment. The distance between an A and a D can be huge or quite small. And I'd like to give you three examples. The first example in the uh, refers to budget transparency. Peru uh, has a single classification, a very transparent one used for budgeting and also for uh, accounting at all government levels. The, uh, it's one of the most advanced countries in the region. There are other neighboring countries that don't have this, not yet. However, we still need more documentation. So, if you ask what is the most important task, unifying all classifiers or better document the budgetary uh, situation, it's the first one. And it's a bigger task. But it's a task that uh, has already uh, been undertaken in Peru. Uh, also, internal audit, that's another example. Carlos mentioned that there are no responses to audit reports. Again, we should ask, what is the biggest task in hand? Implementing the audit or responding to reports? Again, it, it would be bigger to implement an audit but that has already been implemented in Peru. So it's just responding to reports, which is a smaller step. Uh, another issue, accounting, very important. Peru conforms with international uh, accounting standards uh, for the public uh, sector. This is a huge uh, project to implement. What do we need for a better mark? Just comparing results with initial budget. Well, that's a very small step because we know what the initial budget is and we can compare that in a simple Excel sheet. Um, the, the, the figure and the results, so it's a minimum gap in comparison to other countries that do not conform to international standards. The biggest gap is, and the, the biggest weakness is, as we have talked all day today, 
budgeting. The gap between uh, changes, well, the budget and changes made to budget are huge in Peru, much larger than in neighboring countries where we also have gaps, but the gap is much bigger here. So I think this is a task that can be resolved together at national and subnational levels because this has to do with transfers made at the end of the year and then it's impossible to spend those resources because they arrive too late and this can be solved uh, only together with uh, subnational governments this is a big task at hand and there are much better international examples that we can learn from. Muchas gracias, Andreas. Eh, creo que lo han escuchado. No pueden simplemente ver la tabla de los indicadores. Realmente hay que ir un poco atrás de las simples calificaciones A, B, C o D y ver qué es el trabajo que falta, qué hay atrás de esos indicadores. Por eso les recomiendo este resumen escrito por, por Carlos Oliva eh, para no tener que leer todas las 2200 páginas acá hay algo resumido pero con información muy importante justamente eh, un poco de background sobre los distintos indicadores eh, bueno eh, Lucho, Andreas ha, ha mencionado el tema de, de, del, del PIA y del PIM como una de las grandes debilidades eh, de punto de vista eh, del punto de vista de, de un gobierno subnacional, de punto de, de vista del gobierno subnacional de San Martín, eh, ese es el principal desafío o cuáles son los principales retos eh, que tienen ustedes en cuanto a la gestión de finanzas públicas. Eh, Martín, yo considero dos o tres temas. Como eh, la evaluación que trabajó Carlos y de las dos mil páginas, hay que leer el resumen lo podamos eh, constituir en un plan de acción, pero un plan de acción que responda a las expectativas y a las prioridades de cada una de las regiones. Pero que no solamente responda a las expectativas, sino que cómo articulamos con la cooperación de tal manera de que los usuarios, en este caso nosotros los gobiernos subnacionales, también nos tenemos que comprometer en la asignación de, de recursos. En la práctica eh, nacional es creo que no nos comprometemos donde no me mojo, y, y nosotros hemos tenido una buena experiencia porque eh, en, en, en el desarrollo de estas herramientas nos hemos comprometido parte de asignación de recursos para hacer lo que nos interesa. Pero ya cada, cada gobierno subnacional tiene parte de sus experiencias, de sus necesidades y de sus prioridades. Otro tema importante eh, como desafío, entiendo yo, es cómo esta herra, este, este herramienta es necesario mostrar su, su avance y su impacto para darle continuidad lo que la viceministra decía en la mirada de hacer una mejora continua el sistema necesita el país necesita los gobiernos subnacionales lo necesitamos y que es una herramienta con, que, que contribuye contributiva diría yo pero esa herramienta contributiva hay que darle el toque que no tiene la característica de, de sanción ni de, ni de ni de prejuicios, porque eso eso puede confundir eh, al actor político también. Como que si son muchos des, como que no estoy haciendo un buen desarrollo de mi gestión. Y esa es la característica de nuestro país también, que no entendemos que el desarrollo de los sistemas administrativos es un proceso de mejora continua si queremos organizar gobernanza. Si, no, si mis sistemas no, fun no funcionan bien, mi gobernanza va a ser débil. Eso es, es, eso es parte de la experiencia. Y el tercer punto es cómo eh, trascendemos más allá de una buena práctica o de una iniciativa gerencial. Porque se puede mejorar sistemas si hay un buen gerente, hay un buen actor político, eh, debemos ir un poquito más allá. Y entonces, hablando del tema presupuesto, nosotros hemos, creo que hay que organizar más, eso es un tema de política nacional. Pues. Nosotros hemos, hemos caracterizado, ahorita tenemos un problema, por ejemplo, que, que tenemos que resolver en el GORE, 
eh, lo que nosotros llamamos, el, el PIA es un presupuesto anual de 12 meses y de acuerdo a la ley de presupuesto los presupuestos son anuales. Y resulta que en el sistema tenemos presupuestos de nueve meses, y tenemos presupuestos de seis meses, y tenemos presupuestos de diez días, y el año pasado hemos tenido presupuestos de una semana. Lo que decía Carlos Casas, esa es la realidad. Y entonces, ¿cómo mejoramos todo ese sistema en la organización política del Estado para hacer que sea un tema más eficiente? Lo que les quería comentar, ejemplo. Tenemos la red, que debemos terminar este año, la red hospitalaria en San Martín, nos hemos reunido con el equipo técnico, y sabes que nosotros no tenemos plata en el ministerio, porque para nosotros no es continuidad de inversiones, las obras están por terminarse, y ustedes van a ir a un crédito suplementario, crédito suplementario es julio, entonces ayer estaba el presidente, gracias a Dios en Tarapoto, y como que se le ha tocado el tema, porque hay que garantizar que esa, que esa, que esa red y ese sistema concluya. Entonces como que el sistema también no nos ayuda muy bien porque no entendemos el enfoque que el gobierno nacional está desarrollando la, multi, la multianualidad de las inversiones. No vamos a hacer desarrollo, solamente hacemos cosas pequeñas. pues. Si atomizamos las inversiones, ¿cómo mejoramos la calidad social del país si en términos prácticos no miramos ese ejercicio? Y en San Martín ya lo estamos desarrollando. Y hasta hemos tenido algunos problemas en definición de políticas nacionales. Intervenimos la red, la red nacional y de ahí pasamos, vamos entrando a la red vecinal en el enfoque de corredores logísticos, porque no nos interesa quién le corresponde la competencia, sino cómo organizas el territorio para que la gente empiece a tener más plata en sus bolsillos. Y entonces se priorizó un trabajo de dos años, se priorizó eh, con los institutos viales provinciales y se definió cuál debería ser la red y resulta en el cambio de política nacional, es, no, esto ya no va. Dos años en el enfoque de multianualidad y de intervenciones de redes priorizadas por las mismas autoridades locales. Entonces allí también nos falta un poco ajustar la política nacional. ¿Cuál fue el discurso de Provías? Los 300 kilómetros lo vamos a dividir entre, entre 10 provincias. Entonces, la lógica de la intervención de la mirada de desarrollo como que no concuerda con, una, con un buen alineamiento de política. Y no nos ha ayudado y no ayuda mucho a construir desarrollo. Entonces, en esa lógica es que para nosotros este, falta algunas deficiencias de coordinación también eh, interinstitucional. El CEPLAN eh, no ayuda con sus directivas, eh, directiva para apoyo y directiva para evaluación. Y ahí podemos definir un par de directivas y listo. No se alinea bien la fase de programación, formulación con el, con el POI. Entonces yo creo que allí necesitamos un poco trabajar más fino para que la herramienta no sea una carga, para que tener un par de personas que todo el año me estén trabajando POI. Como decía mi abuelita, no mojen que no hay quien planche, porque no tenemos un grupo de gente que esté totalmente dedicada a ese tipo de actividades. Entonces ahí como que nos falta un, una reacción más rápida del sistema, la, hay que estar esperando directivas para evaluación ya nosotros hemos generado nuestra propia directiva para evaluación porque nos interesa ir midiendo cómo vamos caminando si no tenemos medidas de evaluación es como que todos estamos haciendo más de lo mismo y no estamos generando la medición de los impactos yo creo que los gobiernos subnacionales necesitamos esas herramientas y, y, y cómo tenemos que ir mejor, mejorando los aplicativos cómo se, cómo se articulan el POI, el PIA, el cuadro de necesidades, todas esas herramientas que todavía hay algunas, algunas deficiencias. Hay algún ejercicio del gobierno del, de la municipalidad del, del Cusco que le vamos a tener una mirada para ver cómo ordenamos. El problema es que ya estamos en un año electoral. Y un año electoral es un poco difícil si es que el sistema, la autoridad nacional y eh, ustedes como cooperación hay que buscar un momento para mostrar a la próxima actividad política la importancia que tiene estas herramientas. Gracias, Marta. Muy bien, muchas gracias, Lucho. Bueno, como ya se ha mencionado, estamos también transmitir, transmitiendo eh, este debate en vivo a través de Facebook. y También nos han llegado algunas preguntas eh, por Facebook. Una, eh, muy brevemente, Lucho, eh, una pregunta es... Eh, si este PEFA también les servirá, se lo utilizarán 
eh, en el diálogo eh, territorial, en la articulación territorial? Mira, eh, por tiene, que, tiene que ser así. Eh, el territorio no es solamente el gobierno. Y como les decía, la experiencia de San Martín es que tenemos que mirarnos todos los actores transversales. Este país ya no podemos estar peleándonos entre nosotros. Nosotros hemos tenido experiencia de pelearnos y no hay ninguna consecuencia positiva. Entonces, como que eh, es una debilidad del sistema, y eso es propio del sistema, porque las autoridades políticas como que no, no ayudan, cada cual tiene su, su propia parcela, parcela de poder, ¿eh? y, y creo que eso hay que ir desarrollando en el futuro, porque nos falta más cultura política. Y en la medida que miremos el territorio con una mejor cultura política, como que vamos a ayudar las herramientas que se necesita construir en cada espacio territorial. Nosotros hacemos el esfuerzo, por lo menos en, el, en, el, en la actualización del plan, construir nuestra visión de Amazonía. Son, deberíamos ser una región que sus actividades sean bajas en emisiones de carbono, porque nuestra principal potencialidad es la naturaleza. No somos una región agrícola y nos han vendido como región agrícola. Y resulta que todas nuestras actividades productivas no son, pues, este, competitivas. Entonces, como que allí estamos generando todo, toda una corriente para ir haciendo que la valoración de nuestros recursos sean nuestros principales segmentos de generación de riqueza. No contribuyen al PBI todavía significativamente el turismo, los bionegocios y, y la actividad piscícola que deberían contribuir. La agroexportación... Estamos en ese proceso para ir convenciendo que esta herramienta es básica para impulsar procesos de desarrollo. No lo miremos solamente como una herramienta de acción administrativa. Si lo vemos así, la acción de la gestión de las finanzas está muerto. Nace muerto porque vemos que es un requisito indispensable para hacer gestión administrativa de los 11 sistemas que existen. Debemos ser eficientes, pero eso tiene que estar correlacionado con la gestión del desarrollo. En ese enfoque yo creo que se hace sumamente utilitario en el territorio. Gracias. Excelente, muchísimas gracias Lucho. Eh, una pregunta también del público eh, para el secretariado PEFA es si esa experiencia acá en... en eh, Perú, si le van a seguir otras a nivel de la región sudamericana, están otros, eh, otras evaluaciones PEFAS en pipeline para, para la región? Uh, yes. Um, actually, I, I do not have the numbers for uh, the pipeline, but we have, uh, in, in all to date, uh, 117 PEFAS have been undertaken in the region. Uh, 74 at the uh, the national level and um, 43 at the subnational level. So it's it's quite widely used in in the region. As you mentioned a couple of times, the the framework was updated in 2016, um, essentially to reflect that standards for public financial management has increased a little bit, to also reflect experiences with the individual indicators throughout the years, and to reflect new reflect new priorities such as public investment management. Uh, asset and liabilities, and um, and also to mainstream transparency in throughout the framework. And um, already since 2006, uh, uh, we've had uh, 10 national uh, PFAS done in this region using the new framework and uh, and, uh, and and 16 uh, subnational. de la región y en 16 reportes subnacionales. Así que hay realmente una un interés por usar los PFAS. Thank you very much. So now to Uh, close, I would like to go back to Carlos. After your um, participation at the MEF, which is the governing body of... El desempeño de las regiones eh, en gestión de finanzas públicas eh, y después de tu trabajo muy cercano, reciente, con los distintos gobiernos subnacionales que forman parte del programa, eh, ¿cuáles crees tú que es la agenda de trabajo de mejora de la GFP en Perú. Pero me permito anteponer una, una pequeña pregunta que también nos viene vina, vía Facebook y es eh, que cómo se ha logrado hacer esas, esas 11 evaluaciones PEFAS. Bueno, lo que dicen es en el en las regiones hay eh, poca experiencia de gestión de finanzas públicas, cómo han logrado a, eh, hacer esas 11 PEFAS. Tal vez primero esa pequeña pregunta sobre la metodología que han adoptado y después los gran, el gran trabajo en adelante. 
Sí, bueno, se ha logrado con, con mucho trabajo, mucho esfuerzo, mucha coordinación. Aprovecho la pregunta para agradecer en realidad a todo el equipo de, del Basel que, que ha estado detrás de, de esta evaluación. Nosotros tenemos consultores residentes en, en, en estas cinco regiones y también tenemos consultores que viajan eh, todas las semanas. Eh, la verdad que ha sido un trabajo bastante arduo y el hecho de haberlas hecho simultáneamente y un poco respondiendo también a la recomendación de Jens tiene sus pros y sus contras ¿no? eh, si bien es cierto que haber una opción era hacer una validarla, repasarla y después sobre esa base aplicarla al resto el hecho de haberlas hecho simultáneamente nos ha permitido conversar mucho sobre diversos indicadores entre, entre nosotros mismos ¿No? Entonces hay temas que a veces eh, surgían en una región y que al momento de las preguntas, de las entrevistas, por algún motivo no surgían en otra región, pero cuando nos juntábamos entre nosotros y repasábamos, sí veíamos que había todavía espacio para seguir preguntando, seguir indagando. Entonces eso nos ha servido mucho realmente para tener lo que yo creo que son evaluaciones con bastante, bastante calidad y en cierta forma con un estándar de calidad eh, uniforme. El PEFA tiene, el, el ejercicio PEFA tiene eh, una gran virtud que es que te permite ver de un solo repaso todos los sistemas administrativos que tienen que ver con la gestión pública y eso yo creo que es muy útil para los gobiernos eh, subnacionales. ¿no? Tener esta, esa visión holística, como mencionabas tú, Martín, yo creo que es sumamente importante. Nosotros tendemos a priorizar el tema presupuestario, que es donde está la plata y dónde va la plata, pero los otros sistemas son tanto más importantes también, ¿no? Y la articulación entre estos sistemas es lo que al final del día va a hacer que tengamos una buena gestión financiera, ¿no? De nada nos va a valer tener un presupuesto perfecto, digamos, si todo se atora al momento de hacer las licitaciones, ¿no? o si hay corrupción y, y estamos llegando tarde a darnos cuenta de ese tipo de cosas, o si en la tesorería se demoran los pagos dos o tres meses, como, como hemos encontrado en algunos casos. Entonces, tener esta visión comprensiva y holística de toda la cadena, de todo el macroproceso, de lo que significa el, la gestión de las finanzas públicas, yo creo que es algo muy útil para todos los, los líderes. La metodología PEFA no te da... Eh, espacio para hacer muchas recomendaciones no es más una, una fotografía y te dice mira estoy de acuerdo o estoy en el nivel de un estándar internacional o no o estoy en camino a eso entonces yo sí me permitiría eh, yendo ahora sí a, a, a la respuesta eh, y esto ya es una interpretación muy personal de nombrar algunos temas que yo creo que deberían marcar la agenda eh, para el futuro de la gestión de las finanzas públicas. Y el hecho de que haya sido un ejercicio subnacional no nos exime de hacer algunas recomendaciones también para el nivel nacional, ¿no? por los motivos que yo mencionaba al principio de, los, de la rectoría de los sistemas. Lo primero, para el gobierno nacional. Allí yo creo que hay un par de temas que tienen que tomarse muy seriamente eh, para los próximos meses. Primero, tenemos que evitar esta, estas continuas modificaciones presupuestarias y este PIN que es mayor que el PIA. Y una de las claves para hacer eso es tener una buena planificación. Gran parte del problema resiste en que no estamos planificando bien. Históricamente, los documentos de gestión del planeamiento se han aprobado después de que se aprueba el presupuesto. Primero hago el presupuesto, veo para qué me dieron el dinero y sobre esa base yo hago mi, lo que se llama el, el plan operativo institucional. ¿no? Eso sí si es una pésima práctica. Yo no sé si hay muchos países donde, donde siga sucediendo eso. Felizmente ahora ese plan ha tomado el, el todo por las astas y está cambiando todo este, este proceso. Y efectivamente, primero se tiene que hacer la planificación institucional en función a mis planes de desarrollo, en, mi, en función a mis planes estratégicos, y después ajustaré ese plan 
a los techos presupuestarios. ¿no? Eso es lo que nos dice la lógica y esa es la manera como se va a trabajar de ahora en adelante. Ya los gobiernos regionales saben que para el 31 de marzo tienen que tener listo su POI, ¿no? su plan operativo institucional, como insumo para elaborar el presupuesto. La planificación tiene que preceder al presupuesto. Los gobiernos locales tienen el plazo, me parece que es el 31 de julio, ¿no? es un poquito más adelante. Entonces, esto yo creo que es algo a lo que tenemos que apoyar y, eh, por supuesto, no debe quedar esto en palabras y yo creo, sí, acá me, me tomo la licencia de, de, de pedir un poco más de apoyo eh, presupuestario, sobre todo para la asistencia técnica que está brindando el CEPLAN, ¿no? Porque para hacer esto efectivo definitivamente necesitamos más recursos y dar esta asistencia técnica como tiene que ser, porque no es un proceso fácil por lo mismo que les digo que históricamente estamos acostumbrados a hacer las cosas al revés. El segundo tema eh, en el gobierno nacional tiene que ver con el sistema de abastecimientos. Ya lo mencionó eh, Javier en el primer panel, es lamentable que aún no tengamos un rector del sistema de abastecimiento. La ley orgánica del Poder Ejecutivo, que ya tiene, no sé si 12 o 13 años, habla de los 11 sistemas, uno de ellos es el sistema administrativo de abastecimiento y no tenemos un ente rector hasta ahora. Solo tenemos a la OCE, ¿no? al Organismo Supervisor de las Contrataciones del Estado, que no es un rector, es como su nombre lo indica, es un supervisor. ¿no? Y además se centra solamente en la parte de las contrataciones, no en toda la cadena del abastecimiento, que es mucho más amplia de lo que son las contrataciones. Todo el manejo de los almacenes, la logística, el control patrimonial, ¿no? todos estos son temas que tienen que regularse. Tiene que haber un ente rector, que, por supuesto, no solo regule, sino que también dé asistencia técnica a, la, a todas las entidades públicas para perfeccionar este sistema de abastecimiento. Entonces, al final lo que pasa es que cada uno se le está arreglando como puede en los gobiernos regionales y locales. ¿no? Tenemos muchas, eh, muchos casos de almacenes, por ejemplo, que primero no están interconectados entre sí, entonces, un almacén no sabe lo que tiene el almacén que puede estar a cuatro o cinco cuadras. ¿Y eso qué causa? Que muchas veces se repitan los pedidos, por ejemplo. ¿No? Porque no hay un sistema que nos permita a un pliego saber qué tengo efectivamente en cada uno de los almacenes. Y no solo el tema de que hay unos almacenes, sino que naturalmente tenemos que llegar al cliente final que es el ciudadano. Entonces, también muchas veces tenemos casos de bienes, sobre todo en, en, en educación y salud, que se quedan en los almacenes y no llegan o llegan tarde a los, a los puntos donde se tienen que utilizar esas, esos insumos. Eso también es algo muy característico, eh, lamentablemente, y tenemos que hacer una serie de mejoras para que toda la cadena logística esté perfeccionada y eso es una labor, como digo, que tiene que partir de un ente rector y que cada gobierno subnacional también tiene que poner de su parte. En el caso de los gobiernos regionales, yo creo que parte de la agenda tiene que ver con mejorar el manejo que se tiene de sus propias unidades ejecutoras. ¿no? Lo que se llama el enfoque corporativo que tiene que tener un pliego de sus propias unidades ejecutoras. Y ahí yo creo que radica el gran problema o el gran reto de la descentralización. ¿no? Porque un gobierno regional tiene, bueno, en el caso de la Libertad hay 36 unidades ejecutoras, en el caso de la Valleque creo que son 13, distintas unidades ejecutoras, la gran parte tienen que ver con hospitales y, escuel y, y escuelas, digamos, ¿no? Ujeles. El problema allí es que tanto estas unidades ejecutoras de educación y de salud dependen, digamos, funcionalmente de los ministerios, que son los que imparten una serie de normas para, para hacer la presupuestación, por ejemplo. Pero al mismo tiempo dependen administrativamente del gobierno regional. ¿no? Esta articulación entre lo territorial y lo funcional, yo creo que es algo que, sobre lo cual todavía tenemos que seguir trabajando. ¿no? Yo creo que ese es el meollo de la descentralización. 
¿no? Estamos todavía en un punto medio donde no sabemos manejar muy bien este tema de la educación y la salud en los gobiernos regionales. Entonces, a veces el gobierno regional quiere hacer sus planeamientos y el, la, el hospital le dice, no, yo estoy esperando que el Ministerio de Salud me dé la normativa para hacer eh, mi propio planeamiento. Entonces, ahí todavía hay un disloque que tenemos que seguir trabajando. Pero sí es importante que en, bajo este enfoque corporativo, el, los gerentes de la, lo que es la sede central, ¿no?, sean un poquito más proactivos y tengan mayor influencia sobre sus unidades ejecutoras. ¿no? Yo creo que ese es el fondo de la descentralización, esa es la verdadera descentralización. ¿no? Si, mientras todavía no logremos ese, ese enfoque corporativo, eh, yo creo que tenemos mucho, mucho por avanzar. Otro tema que tiene que ver, eh, en este caso, tanto con los gobiernos regionales y locales, es el, la implantación de lo que ya mencionaba Lucho, que es el SIGA, que es el Sistema Integrado de Gestión Administrativa. ¿No? Esta es una herramienta extremadamente poderosa para ordenar el, el sistema de abastecimiento, precisamente, eh, pero es una herramienta que es voluntaria. ¿no? Acá depende de cada uno, de cada gobierno regional o local, si lo puede, eh, lo puede implantar. ¿No? Por, por lo mismo que falta un rector, ¿no? esto no, 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 ha sido, no, no es obligatorio. Y muchas veces cuando el gobierno regional o local quiere eh, implantar su propio SIGA, se da con la sorpresa de que no hay suficientes recursos para poder eh, para, que, para darle la asistencia técnica, porque no es un sistema sencillo. ¿no? Se, necesita, se requiere mucha asistencia técnica para esto. Entonces, el, el tener un SIGA, como ya lo tiene San Martín, y, y por lo menos con, las, con los 11 gobiernos subnacionales con los que trabajamos, estamos haciendo el esfuerzo por tratar de, de ayudarlos a implantar el SIGA, creo que es algo también que todavía eh, tenemos que seguir perfeccionando. Eh, se ha avanzado bastante, ¿no? ya hay municipalidades que ahora tienen el SIGA, eh, pero el SIGA tiene a su vez muchos módulos, ¿no? hay el módulo del patrimonio, para etcétera eh, se está empezando con la instalación de algunos módulos pero tener un SIGA completo con buena asistencia técnica yo creo que va a redondear redundar enormemente en el en, el, en la mejora del, de la eficiencia del gasto público y en el caso de los gobiernos locales sí yo creo que estamos bastante claros ya se mencionaba anteriormente que el tema de los impuestos es el gran desafío que se tiene ¿No? Hay muy poca recaudación del impuesto predial y el impuesto vehicular que tienen las municipalidades provinciales por diversos motivos. ¿no? Hay desde problemas políticos, que bueno a veces no es muy popular cobrar impuestos, entonces hay algunas personas que prefieren no hacerlo. Pero también hay problemas técnicos que tienen que ver con la calidad de los catastros, con la veracidad de los registros públicos, y con los mismos sistemas que son necesarios para recaudar impuestos. ¿no? Eh, con las municipalidades con las que trabajamos, hay algunas que tienen sistemas administrativos tributarios relativamente avanzados, pero hay otros que no los tienen, ¿no? que son muy endebles, ¿no? que no tienen ni siquiera la autonomía mínima para hacer este tipo de recaudación. Entonces, eso también abre toda una gama de, de posibilidades para seguir trabajando, eh, Allí el Ministerio de Economía podría dar algún tipo de, de apoyo, pero yo creo que depende mucho de la voluntad política de los líderes locales para poder implementar este tipo, este tipo de sistema. Felizmente hay algunas que sí funcionan relativamente bien, lo cual significa que hay experiencias de las cuales podemos aprender. ¿no? Hay algunas municipalidades que recaudan, que recaudan bien, entonces yo creo que, que ahí hay todo un área para poder seguir trabajando. Bueno, son algunas reflexiones que, como les digo, eh, surgen tanto de mi experiencia en el Ministerio como de, del repaso este que hemos hecho con las evaluaciones PEFA. Son temas que dan para mucho más, son temas para, para seguir pensándolos, discutiéndolos y espero que, que, que estas reflexiones sirvan pues, para eh, elaborar estos planes de acción que efectivamente deberían trascender a los gobiernos. ¿no? Estamos en el último año de los gobiernos regionales eh, de las administraciones actuales, de los gobiernos regionales y locales. Hay elecciones en octubre, ¿no? pero este tipo de planes tienen que perdurar. 
gane quien gane las próximas elecciones, debería tomar estos planes, estas evaluaciones que se han hecho como una referencia, y sobre esa base eh, intentar mejorar sus sistemas de, de gestión de las finanzas públicas, que al final son... Eh, la pieza clave para mejorar el servicio al ciudadano. ¿no? Si yo quiero dar y tener mejor cobertura, mejor calidad en educación, en salud, que los útiles escolares lleguen a tiempo, que las medicinas lleguen a tiempo, que la gente tenga agua potable, ¿no? todo eso se sostiene en un sistema de finanzas públicas que está detrás que naturalmente no es muy público, la mayoría de la gente no sabe qué pasa allí, pero estoy seguro que todos los que estamos acá sí sabemos de la importancia de tratar de mejorar estos sistemas como base para darle un mejor servicio a los ciudadanos. Gracias. Excelente, muchas gracias Carlos. Eh, bueno, hay muchas autoridades nacionales, subnacionales eh, acá en la sala. Espero que hayan tomado debida nota de esas recomendaciones. Me permito resumirlas otra vez. Una ha sido el reforzamiento de, de la función de planeamiento a través de asistencia técnica de, de ese plan, la creación de un rector de abastecimiento, esas dos recomendaciones más orientadas hacia el gobierno nacional. Eh, el gobierno regional deberían eh, adoptar un enfoque corporativo de pliego, es decir, integrar las unidades eh, ejecutoras eh, y el otro tema, eh, la implementación del SIGA, tanto a nivel eh, regional como, como local, y finalmente también el fortalecimiento de las áreas de tributación y de catastro a nivel de los eh, gobiernos locales. Bueno, con eso cerramos este último panel. Eh, queda claro que eh, se ha avanzado eh, importantemente en los últimos años, pero quedan desafíos eh, importantes eh, todavía por superar. Eh, esos PEFAS han sido un punto de partido, ahora eh, han sido un insumo, entre otros, para la, la elaboración de planes de acción. Eso ya es tarea de los gobiernos subnacionales. Como Cooperación Suiza eh, les puedo asegurar que los pensamos acompañar en la superación de todos esos desafíos también en los años a venir. Bueno, quisiera agradecer a los cuatro panelistas, por favor, fuertes palmas eh, para ellos. Creo que va a haber una foto. Bueno, ahorita eh, quisiera pedir a, a Oscar Solórzano, que es el director del Instituto de Basilea de Gobernanza, para que nos dé las palabras de cierre. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Martín. Gracias a todos los panelistas de este excelente tercer y último panel. No me voy a quitar mucho tiempo, sé que ha sido una jornada intensa, pero no quisiera dejar de agradecer a la Universidad Pacífico por habernos permitido llegar aquí a su casa de estudios. Quería agradecer también a las autoridades aquí presentes, eh, les agradezco profundamente eh, la disposición para venir, a nuestros internacionales también, a Jens, a Martin, a Andreas, a Carlos Orjales que han venido desde Estados Unidos, París, Suiza para apoyarnos en este importante evento. Les agradezco profundamente. Gracias, Martín, nuevamente por estar acá. Bueno, se han hablado muchas cosas hoy día. En particular, se ha, se ha compartido la visión de la GFP desde los sistemas administrativos, desde el mundo subnacional y también desde la academia y desde los practicantes. Perspectivas, yo diría complementarias y no contradictorias, que tienen que seguir en ese desarrollo de largo aliento que significa una reforma de GFP para un país como el nuestro. Eh, por último, y con esto voy a terminar, hemos compartido los, eh, los, 11, los 11 evaluaciones PEFA, los resultados con importantes recomendaciones tanto para el nivel central como para el mundo subnacional, 
eh, que ha tenido el enorme trabajo y responsabilidad de realizar Carlos Oliva con su magnífico equipo. Les agradezco, chicas, también por esta enorme labor que han hecho. Muchas gracias. Y quisiera retomar ahí eh, las palabras de, de, de Lucho Vela, muy importantes, que estas 2.200 páginas no se convierten en una linda publicación que se archiva en un, en un lindo escritorio, sino se conviertan en planes de acción vivos que trasciendan a las personas, que trasciendan a los gobiernos para que se, se inscriban en una reforma de la AFP en el tiempo y en el largo aliento. Espero verdaderamente que esta, eh, estas presentaciones hayan sido de su, de su agrado, de su interés, de los que aquí presentes, como lo de, los, de las personas que nos siguen a través de las redes sociales. Tengo aquí unos datos que me acaban de pasar. Hemos tenido más de 55 mil vistas y unos 120 y picos eh, personas conectadas a través del Facebook y YouTube, y espero que haya sido de utilidad y de agrado de todos ustedes. Bueno, doy por formalmente finalizado este evento, y nuevamente muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes por su presencia. Gracias, y hasta una próxima oportunidad.